Section 14 of Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastiat. Translated by Horace White. Section 14. 10. The Tax Collector. Jacques Bonhomme, vine grower, M. Le Sauche, tax collector. L. You have secured twenty hogsheads of wine. J. Yes, with much care and sweat. Be so kind as to give me six of the best. Six hogsheads out of twenty? Good heavens, you want to ruin me. If you please, what do you propose to do with them? The first will be given to the creditors of the state. When one has debts, the least one can do is to pay the interest. Where did the principal go? It would take too long to tell. A part of it was once upon a time put in cartridges, which made the finest smoke in the world. With another part, men were hired who were maimed on foreign ground, after having ravaged it. Then, when these expenses brought the enemy upon us, he would not leave without taking money with him, which we had to borrow." What good do I get from it now? The satisfaction of saying, How proud am I of being a Frenchman when I behold the triumphal column, and the humiliation of leaving to my heirs an estate burdened with a perpetual rent. Still one must pay what he owes, no matter how foolish a use may have been made of the money. That accounts for one hogshead. But the five others... One is required to pay for public services, the civil list, the judges who decree the restitution of the bit of land your neighbor wants to appropriate, the policemen who drive away robbers while you sleep, the men who repair the road leading to the city, the priest who baptizes your children, the teacher who educates them, and myself, your servant, who does not work for nothing. Certainly service for service. There is nothing to say against that. I had rather make a bargain directly with my priest, but I do not insist on this. So much for the second hogshead. This leaves four, however. Do you believe that two would be too much for your share of the army and navy expenses? Alas, it is little compared with what they have cost me already. They have taken from me two sons whom I tenderly loved. The balance of power in Europe must be maintained. Well, my God, the balance of power would be the same if these forces were everywhere reduced a half or three quarters. We should save our children and our money. All that is needed is to understand it. Yes, but they do not understand it. That is what amazes me, for everyone suffers from it. You wished it so, Jacques Bonhomme. You are jesting, my dear Mr. Collector. Have I a vote in the legislative halls? Whom did you support for deputy? An excellent general, who will be a marshal presently, if God spares his life. On what does this excellent general live? My hogsheads, I presume. And what would happen were he to vote for a reduction of the army and your military establishment? Instead of being a marshal, he would be retired. Do you now understand that yourself? Let us pass to the fifth hogshead, I beg of you. That goes to Algeria. To Algeria? And they tell me that all Mussulmans are temperance people. The barbarians? What services will they give me in exchange for this ambrosia, which has cost me so much labor? None at all. It is not intended for Mussulmans, but for good Christians who spend their days in Barbary. What can they do there which will be of service to me? Undertake and undergo raids, kill and be killed, get dysenteries and come home to be doctored, dig harbors, make roads, build villages and people them with Maltese, Italians, Spaniards, and Swiss, who live on your hogshead, and many others which I shall come in the future to ask of you. Mercy, this is too much, and I flatly refuse you my hogshead. They would send a wine-grower who did such foolish acts to the madhouse. Make roads in the Atlas Mountains when I cannot get out of my own house. 
Dig port in Barbary, when the Garonne fills up with sand every day. Take from me my children whom I love, in order to torment Arabs. Make me pay for the houses, grain and horses, given to the Greeks and Maltese, when there are so many poor around us. The poor, exactly. They free the country of this superfluity. Oh, yes, by sending after them to Algeria the money which would enable them to live here. But then you lay the basis of a great empire. You carry civilization into Africa, and you crown your country with immortal glory. You are a poet, my dear collector, but I am a vine-grower, and I refuse. Think that in a few thousand years you will get back your advances a hundredfold. All those who have charge of the enterprise say so. At first they asked me for one barrel of wine to meet expenses, then two, then three, and now I am taxed a hogshead. I persist in my refusal. It is too late. Your representative has agreed that you shall give a hogshead. That is but too true. Cursed weakness. It seems to me that I was unwise in making him my agent. For what is there in common between the general of an army and the poor owner of a vineyard? You see well that there is something in common between you, were it only the wine you make, and which, in your name, he votes to himself. Laugh at me, I deserve it, my dear collector, but be reasonable, and leave me the sixth hogshead at least. The interest of the debt is paid, the civil list provided for, the public service assured, and the war in Africa perpetuated. What more do you want? The bargain is not made with me. You must tell your desires to the general. He has disposed of your vintage. But what do you propose to do with this poor hogshead, the flower of my flock? Come, taste this wine. How mellow, delicate, velvety it is. Excellent, delicious. It will suit D, the cloth manufacturer, admirably. D, the manufacturer? What do you mean? That he will make a good bargain out of it. How? What is that? I do not understand you. Do you not know that D has started a magnificent establishment, very useful to the country, but which loses much money every year? I am very sorry, but what can I do to help him? The legislature saw that if things went on thus, D would either have to do a better business or close his manufactory. But what connection is there between D's bad speculations and my hogshead? The chamber thought that if it gave D a little wine from your cellar, a few bushels of grain taken from your neighbors, and a few pennies cut from the wages of the workingmen, his losses would change into profits. This recipe is as infallible as it is ingenious, but it is shockingly unjust. What? Is D to cover his losses by taking my wine? Not exactly the wine, but the proceeds of it. That is what we call a bounty for encouragement. But you look amazed. Do not you see what a great service you render to the country? You mean to say to D? To the country. D asserts that, thanks to this arrangement, his business prospers, and thus it is, says he, that the country grows rich. That is what he recently said in the chamber of which he is a member. It is a damnable fraud. What? A fool goes into a silly enterprise, he spends his money, and if he extorts from me wine or grain enough to make good his losses, and even to make him a profit, he calls it a general gain. Your representative having come to that conclusion, all you have to do is to give me the six hogsheads of wine, and sell the fourteen that I leave you for as much as possible. That is my business. For, you see, it would be very annoying if you did not get a good price for them. I will think of it. For there are many things which the money you receive must procure. I know it, sir, I know it. In the first place, if you buy iron to renew your spades and plowshares, a law declares that you must pay the ironmaster twice what it was worth. 
Ah, uh, yes. Does not the same thing happen in the Black Forest? Then, if you need oil, meat, cloth, coal, wool, and sugar, each one by the law will cost you twice what it is worth. But this is horrible, frightful, abominable. What is the use of these hard words? You yourself, through your authorized agent. Leave me alone with my authorized agent. I made a very strange disposition of my vote, it is true. But they shall deceive me no more, and I will be represented by some good and honest countryman. Bah, you will re-elect the worthy general. I, I re-elect the general to give away my wine to Africans and manufacturers. You will re-elect him, I say. That is a little too much. I will not re-elect him, if I do not want to. But you will want to, and you will re-elect him. Let him come here and try. He will see who he will have to settle with. We shall see. Good-bye. I take away your six hogsheads, and will proceed to divide them as the general has directed. 11. Utopian Ideas If I were His Majesty's Minister, well, what would you do? I should begin by, by, upon my word, by being very much embarrassed, for I should be minister only because I had the majority and I should have that only because I had made it, and I could only have made it, honestly at least, by governing according to its ideas. So if I undertake to carry out my ideas, and to run counter to its ideas, I shall not have the majority, and if I do not, I cannot be His Majesty's minister. Just imagine that you are so, and that consequently the majority is not opposed to you. What would you do? I would look to see on which side justice is. And then? I would seek to find where utility was. What next? I would see whether they agreed, or were in conflict with one another. And if you found they did not agree? I would say to the king, take back your portfolio. But suppose you see that justice and utility are one. Then I will go straight ahead. Very well. But to realize utility by justice, a third thing is necessary. What is that? Possibility. You conceded that. When? Just now. How? By giving me the majority. It seems to me that the concession was rather hazardous for it implies that the majority clearly sees what is just, clearly sees what is useful, and clearly sees that these things are in perfect accord. And if it sees this clearly, the good will, so to speak, do itself. This is the point to which you are constantly bringing me, to see a possibility of reform only in the progress of the general intelligence. By this progress all reform is infallible. Certainly, but this preliminary progress takes time. Let us suppose it accomplished. What will you do? For I am eager to see you at work, doing, practicing. I should begin by reducing letter postage to ten centimes. I heard you speak of five ones. Yes, but as I have other reforms in view, I must move with prudence to avoid a deficit in the revenues. Prudence? This leaves you with a deficit of thirty millions. Then I will reduce the salt tax to ten francs. Good. Here is another deficit of thirty millions. Doubtless you have invented some new tax. Heaven forbid. Besides, I do not flatter myself that I have an inventive mind. It is necessary, however. Oh, I have it. What was I thinking of? You are simply going to diminish the expense. I did not think of that. You are not the only one. I shall come to that, but I do not count on it at present. What? You diminish the receipts without lessening expenses, and you avoid a deficit? Yes, by diminishing other taxes at the same time. Here the interlocutor, putting the index finger of his right hand 
on his forehead, shook his head, which may be translated thus. He is rambling terribly. Well, upon my word, this is ingenious. I pay the treasury a hundred francs. You relieve me of five francs on salt, five on postage, and in order that the treasury may nevertheless receive one hundred francs, you relieve me of ten on some other tax. Precisely, you understand me. How can it be true? I am not even sure that I have heard you. I repeat that I balance one remission of taxes by another. I have a little time to give, and I should like to hear you expound this paradox. Here is the whole mystery. I know a tax which costs you twenty francs, not a sou of which gets to the treasury. I relieve you of half of it, and make the other half take its proper destination. You are an unequalled financier. There is but one difficulty. What tax, if you please, do I pay which does not go to the treasury? How much does this suit of clothes cost you? A hundred francs. How much would it have cost you if you had gotten the cloth from Belgium? Eighty francs. Then why did you not get it there? Because it is prohibited. Why? So that the suit may cost me one hundred francs instead of eighty. This denial, then, costs you twenty francs. Undoubtedly. And where do these twenty francs go? Where do they go? To the manufacturer of the cloth. Well, give me ten francs for the treasury, and I will remove the restriction, and you will gain ten francs. Oh, I begin to see. The treasury accounts shows that it loses five francs on postage and five on salt, and gains ten on cloth. That is even. Your account is... You gain five francs on salt, five on postage, and ten on cloth. Total twenty francs. This is satisfactory enough, but what becomes of the poor cloth manufacturer? Oh, I have thought of him. I have secured compensation for him by means of the tax reductions, which are so profitable to the treasury. What I have done for you as regards cloth, I do for him in regard to wool, coal, machinery, etc., so that he can lower his price without laws. But are you sure that will be an equivalent? The balance will be in his favor. The twenty francs that you gain on the cloth will be multiplied by those which I will save for you on grain, meat, fuel, etc. This will amount to a large sum, and each one of your thirty-five million fellow citizens will save the same way. There will be enough to consume the claws of both Belgium and France. The nation will be better clothed. That is all. I will think on this, for it is somewhat confused in my head. After all, as far as clothes go, the main thing is to be clothed. Your limbs are your own, and not the manufacturer's. To shield them from cold is your business and not his. If the law takes sides for him against you, the law is unjust and you allowed me to reason on the hypothesis that what is unjust is hurtful. Perhaps I admitted too much, but go on and explain your financial plan. Then I will make a tariff. In two folio volumes? No, in two sections. Then they will no longer say that this famous axiom, no one is supposed to be ignorant of the law, is a fiction. Let us see your tariff. Here it is, first section. All imports shall pay an ad valorem tax of five per cent. Even raw materials? Unless they are worthless. But they all have value, much or little. Then they will pay much or little. How can our manufactories compete with foreign ones, which have these raw materials free. The expenses of the state being certain, if we close this source of revenue, we must open another. This will not diminish the relative inferiority of our manufactories, and there will be one bureau more to organize and pay. That is true. I reasoned as if the tax was to be annulled, not changed, 
I will reflect on this. What is your second section? Section second. All exports shall pay an ad valorem tax of five per cent. Merciful heavens, Mr. Utopist, you will certainly be stoned, and if it comes to that, I will throw the first one. We agree that the majority were enlightened. Enlightened? Can you claim that an export duty is not onerous? All taxes are onerous, but this is less so than others. The carnival justifies many eccentricities. Be so kind as to make this new paradox appear specious if you can. How much did you pay for this wine? A franc per quart. How much would you have paid outside the city gates? Fifty centimes. Why this difference? Ask the octroi, which added ten sous to it. Who established the octroi? The municipality of Paris, in order to pave and light the streets. This is then an import duty. But if the neighboring country districts had established this octroi for their profit, what would happen? I should none the less pay a franc for wine worth only fifty centimes, and the other fifty centimes would pave and light the Montmartre and the Batignolles. So that really it is the consumer who pays the tax? There is no doubt of that. Then by taxing exports you make foreigners help pay your expenses. I find you at fault. This is not justice. Why not? In order to secure the production of any one thing, there must be instruction, security, roads, and other costly things in the country. Why shall not the foreigner who is to consume this product bear the charges its production necessitates? This is contrary to received ideas. Not the least in the world. The last purchaser must repay all the direct and indirect expenses of production. No matter what you say, it is plain that such a measure would paralyze commerce and cut off all exports. That is an illusion. If you were to pay this tax besides all the others, you would be right. But if the hundred millions raised in this way relieve you of other taxes to the same amount, you go into foreign markets with all your advantages, and even with more, if this duty has occasioned less embarrassment and expense. I will reflect on this. So now the salt, postage and customs are regulated. Is all ended there? I am just beginning. Pray initiate me in your utopian ideas. I have lost sixty millions on salt and postage. I shall regain them through the customs, which also gives me something more precious. What, pray? International relations founded on justice, and a probability of peace, which is equivalent to a certainty. I will disband the army. The whole army? Except special branches, which will be voluntarily recruited, like all other professions. You see, conscription is abolished. Sir, you should say recruiting. Ah, I forgot. I cannot help admiring the ease with which, in certain countries, the most unpopular things are perpetuated by giving them other names. Like consolidated duties, which have become indirect contributions. And the gendarmes, who have taken the name of municipal guards. In short, trusting to utopia, you disarm the country. I said that I would muster out the army, not that I would disarm the country. I intend, on the contrary, to give it invincible power. How do you harmonize this mass of contradictions? I call all the citizens to service. Is it worth while to relieve a portion from service in order to call out everybody? You did not make me minister in order that I should leave things as they are. Thus, on my advent to power, I shall say with Richelieu, the state maxims are changed. My first maxim, the one which will serve as a basis for my administration, is this. Every citizen must know two things. How to earn his own living, and defend his country. 
It seems to me, at the first glance, that there is a spark of good sense in this. Consequently, I base the national defense on a law consisting of two sections. Section first. Every able-bodied citizen, without exception, shall be under arms for four years, from his twenty-first to his twenty-fifth year, in order to receive military instruction. This is pretty economy. You send home four hundred thousand soldiers, and call out ten millions. Listen to my second section. Section 2. Unless he proves, at the age of twenty-one, that he knows the school of the soldier perfectly. I did not expect this turn. It is certain that to avoid four years' service, there will be a great emulation among our youth to learn, by the right flank, and double-quick march. The idea is odd. It is better than that, for without grieving families and offending equality, does it not assure the country, in a simple and inexpensive manner, of ten million defenders, capable of defying a coalition of all the standing armies of the globe? Truly, if I were not on my guard, I should end in getting interested in your fancies. The utopist, getting excited, Thank heaven, my estimates are relieved of a hundred millions. I suppress the octroi. I refund indirect contributions. I, getting more and more excited, I will proclaim religious freedom and free instruction. There shall be new resources. I will buy the railroads, pay off the public debt, and starve out the stock gamblers. My dear utopist, freed from too numerous cares, I will concentrate all the resources of the government on the repression of fraud, the administration of prompt and even-handed justice. I, my dear utopist, you attempt too much. The nation will not follow you. You gave me the majority. I take it back. Very well. Then I am no longer minister. But my plans remain what they are. Utopian ideas. 12. Salt, Postage, and Customs This chapter is an amusing dialogue relating principally to English postal reform. Being inapplicable to any condition of things existing in the United States, it is omitted. Translator End of section 14 Recording by Katie Riley May 2010《Section 15 of Sophisms of the Protectionists》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Sophisms of the Protectionists》by Frédéric Bastia Translated by Horace White Section 15 13. The Three Aldermen a demonstration in four tableau. First tableau. The scene is in the hotel of Alderman Pierre. The window looks out on a fine park. Three persons are seated near a good fire. Pierre. Upon my word, a fire is very comfortable when the stomach is satisfied. It must be agreed that it is a pleasant thing. But, alas, how many worthy people, like the king of Yevto, blow on their fingers for want of wood. Unhappy creatures, heaven inspires me with a charitable thought. You see these fine trees. I will cut them down and distribute the wood among the poor. Paul and Jean. What? Gratis? Pierre. Not exactly. There would soon be an end of my good works if I scattered my property thus. I think that my park is worth twenty thousand livers. By cutting it down, I shall get much more for it. Paul. A mistake. Your wood as it stands is worth more than that in the neighboring forests, for it renders services which that cannot give. When cut down it will, like that, be good for burning only, and will not be worth a sou more per cord. Pierre. Oh, Mr. Theorist, you forget that I am a practical man. I supposed that my reputation as a speculator was well enough established to put me above any charge of stupidity. 
Do you think that I shall amuse myself by selling my wood at the price of other wood? Paul. You must. Pierre. Simpleton. Suppose I prevent the bringing of any wood to Paris. Paul. That will alter the case, but how will you manage it? Pierre. This is the whole secret. You know that wood pays an entrance duty of ten sous per cord. Tomorrow I will induce the alderman to raise this duty to one hundred, two hundred, or three hundred livres, so high as to keep out every faggot. Well, do you see, if the good people do not want to die of cold, they must come to my wood-yard. They will fight for my wood. I shall sell it for its weight in gold, and this well-regulated deed of charity will enable me to do others of the same sort. Paul this is a fine idea, and it suggests an equally good one to me. Jean. Well, what is it? Paul. How do you find this Normandy butter? Jean. Excellent. Paul. Well, it seemed passable a moment ago. But do you not think it is a little strong? I want to make a better article at Paris. I will have four or five hundred cows and I will distribute milk, butter, and cheese to the poor people. Pierre and Jean. What? As a charity? Paul. Bah, let us always put charity in the foreground. It is such a fine thing that its counterfeit even is an excellent card. I will give my butter to the people, and they will give me their money. Is that called selling? Jean. No, according to the bourgeois gentilhomme, but call it what you please. You ruin yourself. Can Paris compete with Normandy in raising cows? Paul. I shall save the cost of transportation. Jean. Very well, but the Normans are able to beat the Parisians, even if they do have to pay for transportation. Paul. Do you call it beating any one to furnish him things at a low price? Jean. It is the time-honored word. You will always be beaten. Paul. Yes, like Don Quixote. The blows will fall on Sancho. Jean, my friend, you forgot the octroi. Jean. The octroi? What has that to do with your butter? Paul. Tomorrow I will demand protection, and I will induce the council to prohibit the butter of Normandy and Brittany. The people must do without butter, or buy mine, and at my price, too. Jean. Gentlemen, your philanthropy carries me along with it. In time one learns to howl with the wolves. It shall not be said that I am an unworthy alderman. Pierre, this sparkling fire has illumined your soul. Paul, this butter has given an impulse to your understanding, and I perceive that this piece of salt pork stimulates my intelligence. Tomorrow I will vote myself, and make others vote, for the exclusion of hogs, dead or alive. This done, I will build superb stockyards in the middle of Paris, for the unclean animal forbidden to the Hebrews. I will become swineherd and pork seller, and we shall see how the good people of Lutia can help getting their food at my shop. Pierre, gently, my friends, if you thus run up the price of butter and salt meat, you diminish the profit which I expected from my wood. Paul. Nor is my speculation so wonderful if you ruin me with your fuel and your hams. Jean. What shall I gain by making you pay an extra price for my sausages, if you overcharge me for pastry and faggots? Pierre. Do you not see that we are getting into a quarrel? Let us rather unite. Let us make reciprocal concessions. Besides, it is not well to listen only to miserable self-interest. Humanity is concerned, and must not the warming of the people be secured. Paul. That is true, and people must have butter to spread on their bread. Jean. Certainly, and they must have a bit of pork for their soup. Altogether. Forward, charity! Long live philanthropy! Tomorrow! Tomorrow we will take the octroi by assault. Pierre. Ah, I forgot. One more word which is important. 
My friends, in this selfish age, people are suspicious, and the purest intentions are often misconstrued. Paul, you plead for wood. Jean, defend butter. And I will devote myself to domestic swine. It is best to head off invidious suspicions. Paul and Jean, leaving. Upon my word, what a clever fellow! Second Tableau The Common Council Paul My dear colleagues, every day great quantities of wood come into Paris, and draw out of it large sums of money. If this goes on, we shall all be ruined in three years, and what will become of the poor people? Bravo! Let us prohibit foreign wood. I am not speaking for myself, for you could not make a toothpick out of all the wood I own. I am therefore perfectly disinterested. Good, good. But here is Pierre, who has a park, and he will keep our fellow citizens from freezing. They will no longer be in a state of dependence on the charcoal dealers of the Yon. Have you ever thought of the risk we run of dying of cold if the proprietors of these foreign forests should take it into their heads not to bring any more wood to Paris. Let us therefore prohibit wood. By this means we shall stop the drain of specie, we shall start the wood-chopping business, and open to our workmen a new source of labor and wages. Applause. Jean. I second the motion of the Honorable Member, a proposition so philanthropic and so disinterested as he remarked. It is time that we should stop this intolerable freedom of entry, which has brought a ruinous competition upon our market, so that there is not a province tolerably well situated for producing some one article which does not inundate us with it, sell it to us at a low price, and oppress Parisian labor. It is the business of the state to equalize the conditions of production by wisely graduated duties to allow the entrance from without of whatever is dearer there than at Paris, and thus relieve us from an unequal contest. How, for instance, can they expect us to make milk and butter in Paris, as against Brittany and Normandy? Think, gentlemen, the Bretons have land cheaper, feed more convenient, and labor more abundant. Does not common sense say that the conditions must be equalized by a protecting duty? I ask that the duty on milk and butter be raised to a thousand percent, and more if necessary. The breakfasts of the people will cost a little more, but wages will rise. We shall see the building of stables and dairies, a good trade in churns, and the foundation of new industries laid. I myself have not the least interest in this plan. I am not a cowherd, nor do I desire to become one. I am moved by the single desire to be useful to the laboring classes. Expressions of Approbation Pierre I am happy to see in this assembly statesmen so pure, enlightened, and devoted to the interests of the people. Cheers I admire their self-denial, and cannot do better than follow such noble examples. I support their motion and I also make one to exclude Watsu hogs. It is not that I want to become a swineherd or pork dealer, in which case my conscience would forbid my making this motion, but is it not shameful, gentlemen, that we should be paying tribute to these poor Poitevin peasants, who have the audacity to come into our own market, take possession of a business that we could have carried on ourselves, and, after having inundated us with sausages and hams, take from us, perhaps, nothing in return. Anyhow, who says that the balance of trade is not in their favor, and that we are not compelled to pay them a tribute in money? Is it not plain that if this plot of an industry were planted in Paris, it would open new fields to Parisian labor? Moreover, gentlemen, is it not very likely, as Mr. Lestibadois said, that we buy these plot of salted meats, not with our income, but with our capital? Where will this land us? Let us not allow greedy, avaricious, and perfidious rivals to come here and sell things cheaply, thus making it impossible for us to produce them ourselves. Aldermen, Paris has given us its confidence, and we must show ourselves worthy of it. The people are without labor, 
and we must create it. And if salted meat costs them a little more, we shall, at least, have the consciousness that we have sacrificed our interests to those of the masses, as every good alderman ought to do. Thunders of applause. A voice. I hear much said of the poor people, but, under the pretext of giving them labor, you begin by taking away from them that which is worth more than labor itself, wood, butter, and soup. Pierre, Paul, and Jean. Vote, vote. Away with your theorists and generalizers. Let us vote. The three motions are carried. Third tableau. Twenty years after. Son. Father, decide. We must leave Paris. Work is slack, and everything is dear. Father. My son, you do not know how hard it is to leave the place where we were born. Son. The worst of all things is to die there of misery. Father. Go, my son, and seek a more hospitable country. For myself, I will not leave the grave where your mother, sisters, and brothers lie. I am eager to find, at last, near them, the rest which is denied me in this city of desolation. Son. Courage, dear father, we will find work elsewhere, in Poitou, Normandy, or Brittany. They say that the industry of Paris is gradually transferring itself to those distant countries. Father. It is very natural. Unable to sell us wood and food, they stopped producing more than they needed for themselves, and they devoted their spare time and capital to making those things which we formerly furnished them. Son. Just as at Paris, they quit making handsome furniture and fine clothes, in order to plant trees and raise hogs and cows. Though quite young, I have seen vast storehouses, sumptuous buildings, and quays thronged with life on those banks of the Seine, which are now given up to meadows and forests. Father. While the provinces are filling up with cities, Paris becomes country. What a frightful revolution! Three mistaken aldermen, aided by public ignorance, have brought down on us this terrible calamity. Son, tell me this story, my father. Father, it is very simple. Under the pretext of establishing three new trades at Paris, and of thus supplying labor to the workmen, these men secured the prohibition of wood, butter, and meats. They assumed the right of supplying their fellow citizens with them. These articles rose immediately to an exorbitant price. Nobody made enough to buy them, and the few who could procure them by using up all they made were unable to buy anything else. Consequently, all branches of industry stopped at once. All the more so because the provinces no longer offered a market. Misery, death, and emigration began to depopulate Paris. Son, when will this stop? Father, when Paris has become a meadow and a forest. Son, the three aldermen must have made a great fortune. Father, at first they made immense profits, but at length they were involved in the common misery. Son, how was that possible? Father, you see this ruin. It was a magnificent house, surrounded by a fine park. If Paris had kept on advancing, Master Pierre would have got more rent from it annually than the whole thing is now worth to him. Son. How can that be, since he got rid of competition? Father. Competition in selling has disappeared, but competition in buying also disappears every day, and will keep on disappearing until Paris is an open field and Master Pierre's woodland will be worth no more than an equal number of acres in the forest of Bondy. Thus a monopoly, like every species of injustice, brings its own punishment upon itself. Son, this does not seem very plain to me, but the decay of Paris is undeniable. Is there then no means of repealing this unjust measure that Pierre and his colleagues adopted twenty years ago? Father, I will confide my secret to you. I will remain at Paris for this purpose, 
I will call the people to my aid. It depends on them whether they will replace the octroi on its old basis, and dismiss from it this fatal principle, which is grafted on it, and has grown there like a parasite fungus. Son, you want to succeed on the very first day. Father, no, on the contrary, the work is a difficult and laborious one. Pierre, Paul, and Jean understand one another perfectly. They are ready to do anything rather than allow the entrance of wood, butter, and meat into Paris. They even have on their side the people, who clearly see the labor, which these three protected branches of business give, who know how many wood-choppers and cow-drivers it gives employment to, but who cannot obtain so clear an idea of the labor that would spring up in the free air of liberty. Son, if this is all that is needed, you will enlighten them. Father, my child, at your age, one doubts at nothing. If I wrote, the people would not read, for all their time is occupied in supporting a wretched existence. If I speak, the aldermen will shut my mouth. The people will, therefore, remain long in their fatal error. Political parties, which build their hopes on their passions, attempt to play upon their prejudices, rather than to dispel them. I shall then have to deal with the powers that be, the people and the parties. I see that a storm will burst on the head of the audacious person who dares to rise against an iniquity which is so firmly rooted in the country. Son, you will have justice and truth on your side. Father, and they will have force and calumny. If I were only young, but age and suffering have exhausted my strength. Son, well, father, devote all that you have left to the service of the country. Begin this work of emancipation, and leave to me for an inheritance the task of finishing it. Fourth Tableau The Agitation Jacques Bonham Parisians, let us demand the reform of the octroi. Let it be put back to what it was. Let every citizen be free to buy wood, butter, and meat where it seems good to him. The people. Hurrah for liberty! Pierre. Parisians, do not allow yourselves to be seduced by these words. Of what avail is the freedom of purchasing, if you have not the means? And how can you have the means if labor is wanting? Can Paris produce wood as cheaply as the forest of Bondy, or meat at as low price as Poitou, or butter as easily as Normandy? If you open the door to these rival products, what will become of the woodcutters, pork dealers, and cattle drivers? They cannot do without protection. The people. Hurrah for protection! Jacques. Protection? But do they protect you, workmen? Do not you compete with one another? Let the wood dealers then suffer competition in their turn. They have no right to raise the price of their wood, by law, unless they, also, by law, raise wages. Do you not still love equality? The people. Hurrah for equality! Pierre. Do not listen to this facetious fellow. We have raised the price of wood, meat, and butter, it is true. But it is in order that we may give good wages to the workmen. We are moved by charity. The people. Hurrah for charity! Jacques. Use the octroi, if you can, to raise wages, or do not use it to raise the price of commodities. The Parisians do not ask for charity, but justice. The people. Hurrah for justice! Pierre. It is precisely the dearness of products which will, by reflex action, raise wages. The people. Hurrah for dearness! Jacques. If butter is dear, it is not because you pay workmen well. It is not even that you may make great profits. It is only because Paris is ill-situated for this business, and because you desired that they should do in the city what ought to be done in the country, and in the country what was done in the city. 
the people have no more labor, only they labor at something else. They get no more wages, but they do not buy things as cheaply. The people, hurrah for cheapness! Pierre, this person seduces you with his fine words. Let us state the question plainly. Is it not true that if we admit butter, wood, and meat, we shall be inundated with them, and die of a plethora? There is then no way in which we can preserve ourselves from this new inundation, than to shut the door, and we can keep up the price of things, only by causing scarcity artificially. A very few voices. Hurrah for scarcity! Jacques. Let us state the question as it is. Among all the Parisians we can divide only what is in Paris. The less wood, butter, and meat there is, the smaller each one's share will be. There will be less if we exclude than if we admit. Parisians, individual abundance can exist only where there is general abundance. The people. Hurrah for abundance! Pierre. No matter what this man says, he cannot prove to you that it is to your interest to submit to unbridled competition. The people. Down with competition! Jacques. Despite all this man's declamation, he cannot make you enjoy the sweets of restriction. The people. Down with restriction! Pierre. I declare to you that if poor dealers in cattle and hogs are deprived of their livelihood, if they are sacrificed to theories. I will not be answerable for public order. Workmen distrust this man. He is an agent of perfidious Normandy. He is under the pay of foreigners. He is a traitor and must be hanged. The people keep silent. Jacques. Parisians, all that I say now, I said to you twenty years ago, when it occurred to Pierre to use the octroi for his gain and your laws. I am not an agent of Normandy. Hang me if you will, but this will not prevent oppression from being oppression. Friends, you must kill neither Jacques nor Pierre, but liberty if it frightens you, or restriction if it hurts you. The people. Let us hang nobody, but let us emancipate everybody. End of section 15. Recording by Katie Riley. May 2010. Section 16 of Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastiat Translated by Horace White Section 16 14. Something else What is restriction? A partial prohibition What is prohibition? An absolute restriction So what is said of one is true of the other? Yes, comparatively they bear the same relation to each other that the arc of the circle does to the circle. Then if prohibition is bad, restriction cannot be good. No more than the arc can be straight if the circle is curved. What is the common name for restriction and prohibition? Protection. What is the definite effect of protection? To require from men harder labor for the same result. Why are men so attached to the protective system? Because, since liberty would accomplish the same result, with less labor, this apparent diminution of labor frightens them. Why do you say apparent? Because all labor economized can be devoted to something else. What? That cannot and need not be determined. Why? Because if the total of the comforts of France could be gained with a diminution of one-tenth of the total of its labor, no one could determine what comforts it would procure with the labor remaining at its disposal. 
one would prefer to be better clothed, another better fed, another better taught, and another more amused. Explain the workings and effect of protection. It is not an easy matter. Before taking hold of a complicated instance, it must be studied in the simplest one. Take the simplest you choose. Do you recollect how Robinson Crusoe, having no saw, set to work to make a plank? Yes, he cut down a tree, and then with his axe hewed the trunk on both sides until he got it down to the thickness of a board. And that gave him an abundance of work. Fifteen full days. What did he live on during this time? His provisions. What happened to the axe? It was all blunted. Very good. But there is one thing which, perhaps, you do not know. At the moment that Robinson gave the first blow with his axe, he saw a plank which the waves had cast up on the shore. Oh, the lucky accident! He ran to pick it up. It was his first impulse, but he checked himself, reasoning thus. If I go after this plank, it will cost me but the labor of carrying it, and the time spent in going to and returning from the shore. But if I make a plank with my axe, I shall in the first place obtain work for fifteen days. Then I shall wear out my axe, which will give me an opportunity of repairing it, and I shall consume my provisions, which will be a third source of labor, since they must be replaced. Now labor is wealth. It is plain that I will ruin myself if I pick up this stranded board. It is important to protect my personal labor, and now that I think of it, I can create myself additional labor by kicking this board back into the sea. But this reasoning was absurd. Certainly. Nevertheless, it is that adopted by every nation which protects itself by prohibition. It rejects the plank which is offered it in exchange for a little labor, in order to give itself more labor. It sees a gain even in the labor of the custom-house officer. This answer to the trouble which Robinson took to give back to the waves the present they wished to make him. Consider the nation a collective being, and you will not find an atom of difference between its reasoning and that of Robinson. Did not Robinson see that he could use the time saved in doing something else? What something else? So long as one has once and time, one has always something to do. I am not bound to specify the labor that he could undertake. I can specify very easily that which he would have avoided. I assert that Robinson, with incredible blindness, confounded labor with its result, and the end with the means, and I will prove it to you. It is not necessary, but this is the restrictive or prohibitory system in its simplest form. If it appears absurd to you, thus stated, it is because the two qualities of producer and consumer are here united in the same person. Let us pass, then, to a more complicated instance. Willingly, some time after all this, Robinson having met Friday, they united, and began to work in common. They hunted for six hours each morning, and brought home four hampers of game. They worked in the garden for six hours each afternoon, and obtained four baskets of vegetables. One day a canoe touched at the island of despair. A good-looking stranger landed, and was allowed to dine with our two hermits. He tasted and praised the products of the garden, and before taking leave of his hosts, said to them, Generous islanders, I dwell in a country much richer in game than this, but where horticulture is unknown. It would be easy for me to bring you every evening four hampers of game, if you would give me only two baskets of vegetables. At these words Robinson and Friday stepped on one side, to have a consultation, and the debate which followed is too interesting not to be given in extenso. Friday. Friend, what do you think of it? Robinson. If we accept, we are ruined. Friday. Is that certain? Calculate. Robinson. It is all calculated. Hunting, crushed out by competition, will be a lost branch of industry for us. Friday. What difference does that make, if we have the game? Robinson. 
theory, it will not be the product of our labor. Friday. Yes, it will, since we will have to give vegetables to get it. Robinson. Then what shall we make? Friday. The four hampers of game cost us six hours' labor. The stranger gives them to us for two baskets of vegetables, which take us but three hours. Thus three hours remain at our disposal. Robinson. Say rather that they are taken from our activity. There is our loss. Labor is wealth, and if we lose a fourth of our time, we are one-fourth poorer. Friday. Friends, you make an enormous mistake. The same amount of game and vegetables, and three free hours to boot make progress, or there is none in the world. Robinson. Mere generalities. What will we do with these three hours? Friday. We will do something else. Robinson. Ah, now I have you. You can specify nothing. It is very easy to say, something else, something else. Friday. We will fish. We will adorn our houses. We will read the Bible. Robinson. Utopia. Is it certain that we will do this rather than that? Friday. Well, if we have no wants, we will rest. Is rest nothing? Robinson. When one rests, one dies of hunger. Friday. Friend, you are in a vicious circle. I speak of a rest which diminishes neither our gains nor our vegetables. You always forget that by means of our commerce with this stranger, nine hours of labor will give us as much food as twelve now do. Robinson. It is easy to see that you were not reared in Europe. Perhaps you have never read the Moniteur Industrial. It would have taught you this. All time saved is a dear loss. Eating is not the important matter, but working. Nothing which we consume counts, if it is not the product of our labor. Do you wish to know whether you are rich? Do not look at your comforts, but at your trouble. This is what the Moniteur Industrial would have taught you. I, who am not a theorist, see but the loss of our hunting. Friday. What a strange perversion of ideas, but... Robinson, no buts. Besides, there are political reasons for rejecting the interested offers of this perfidious stranger. Friday. Political reasons? Robinson. Yes. In the first place he makes these offers only because they are for his advantage. Friday. So much the better, since they are for ours also. Robinson. Then by these exchanges we shall become dependent on him. Friday. And he on us. We need his game, he our vegetables, and we will live in good friendship. Robinson. Fancy. Do you want I should leave you without an answer? Friday. Let us see. I am still waiting a good reason. Robinson. Supposing that the stranger learns to cultivate a garden, and that his island is more fertile than ours, do you see the consequences? Friday. Yes. Our relations with the stranger will stop. He will take no more vegetables from us, since he can get them at home with less trouble. He will bring us no more game, since we will have nothing to give in exchange and we will be, then, just where you want us to be now. Robinson. Short-sighted savage, you do not see that after having destroyed our hunting, by inundating us with game, he will kill our gardening by overwhelming us with vegetables. Friday. But he will do that only so long as we can give him something else. That is to say, so long as we find something else to produce, which will economize our labor. Robinson. Something else, something else. You always come back to that. You are very vague, friend Friday. There is nothing practical in your views. The contest lasted a long time, and as often happens, left each one convinced that he was right. However, Robinson having great influence over Friday, his views prevailed, and when the stranger came for an answer, Robinson said to him, 
stranger in order that your proposition may be accepted we must be quite sure of two things the first is that your island is not richer in game than ours for we will struggle but with equal arms the second is that you will lose by the bargain for as in every exchange there is necessarily a gainer and a loser we would be cheated if you were not what have you to say nothing nothing replied the stranger who burst out laughing and returned to his canoe the story would not be bad if robinson was not so foolish he is no more so than the committee in hauteville street oh there is a great difference you suppose one solitary man or what comes to the same thing two men living together this is not our world the diversity of occupations and the intervention of merchants and money change the question materially all this complicates transactions but does not change their nature what do you propose to compare modern commerce to mere exchanges commerce is but a multitude of exchanges the real nature of the exchange is identical with the real nature of commerce as small labor is of the same nature with great and as the gravitation which impels an atom is of the same nature as that which attracts a world thus according to you these arguments which in robinson's mouth are so false are no less so in the mouths of our protectionists yes only error is hidden better under the complication of circumstances well now select some instance from what has actually occurred very well in france in view of custom and the exigencies of the climate cloth is a useful article is it the essential thing to make it or to have it a pretty question to have it we must make it that is not necessary it is certain that to have it some one must make it but it is not necessary that the person or country using it should make it you did not produce that which clothes you so well nor france the coffee it uses for breakfast but i purchased my cloth and france its coffee exactly and with what with specie but you did not make the specie nor did france we bought it with what with our products which went to peru then it is in reality your labor that you exchange for cloth and french labor that is exchanged for coffee certainly then is it not absolutely necessary to make what one consumes no if one makes something else and gives it in exchange in other words france has two ways of procuring a given quantity of cloth the first is to make it and the second is to make something else and exchange that something else abroad for cloth of these two ways which is the best i do not know is it not that which for a fixed amount of labor gives the greatest quantity of cloth it seems so which is the best for a nation to have the choice of these two ways or to have the law forbid its using one of them at the risk of rejecting the best it seems to me that it would be best for the nation to have the choice since in these matters it always makes a good selection the law which prohibits the introduction of foreign cloth decides then that if france wants cloth it must make it at home and that it is forbidden to make that something else with which it could purchase foreign cloth that is true and as it is obliged to make cloth and forbidden to make something else just because the other thing would require less labor without which france would have no occasion to do anything with it the law virtually decrees that for a certain amount of labor france shall have but one yard of cloth making it itself when for the same amount of labor it could have had two yards by making something else but what other thing no matter what being free to choose it will make something else only so long as there is something else to make that is possible but i cannot rid myself of the idea that the foreigners may send us cloth and not take something else in which case we shall be prettily caught 
under all circumstances this is the objection even from your own point of view you admit that france will make this something else which is to be exchanged for cloth with less labor than if it had made the cloth itself doubtless then a certain quantity of its labor will become inert yes but people will be no worse clothed a little circumstance which causes the whole misunderstanding robinson lost sight of it and our protectionists do not see it or pretend not to the stranded plank thus paralyzed for fifteen days robinson's labor so far as it was applied to the making of a plank but it did not deprive him of it distinguish then between these two kinds of diminution of labor one resulting in privation and the other in comfort these two things are very different and if you assimilate them you reason like robinson in the most complicated as in the most simple instances the sophism consists in this judging of the utility of labor by its duration and intensity and not by its results which leads to this economic policy a reduction of the results of labor in order to increase its duration and intensity fifteen the little arsenal of the free trader if they say to you there are no absolute principles prohibition may be bad and restriction good reply restriction prohibits all that it keeps from coming in if they say to you agriculture is the nursing mother of the country reply that which feeds a country is not exactly agriculture but grain if they say to you the basis of the sustenance of the people is agriculture reply the basis of the sustenance of the people is grain thus a law which causes two bushels of grain to be obtained by agricultural labor at the expense of four bushels which the same labor would have produced but for it far from being a law of sustenance is a law of starvation if they say to you a restriction on the admission of foreign grain leads to more cultivation and consequently to a greater home production reply it leads to sowing on the rocks of the mountains and the sands of the sea to milk and steadily milk a cow gives more milk for who can tell the moment when not a drop more could be obtained but the drop costs dearer if they say to you let bread be dear and the wealthy farmer will enrich the artisans reply bread is dear when there is little need of it a thing which can make but poor or if you please rich people who are starving if they insist on it saying when food is dear wages rise reply by showing that in april eighteen forty seven five-sixths of the working men were beggars if they say to you the profits of the working men must rise with the dearness of food reply this is equivalent to saying that in an unprovisioned vessel everybody has the same number of biscuits whether he has any or not if they say to you a good price must be secured for those who sell grain reply certainly but good wages must be secured to those who buy it if they say to you the landowners who make the law have raised the price of food without troubling themselves about wages because they know that when food becomes dear wages naturally rise reply on this principle when workingmen come to make the law do not blame them if they fix a high rate of wages without troubling themselves to protect grain for they know that if wages are raised articles of food will naturally rise in price if they say to you what then is to be done reply be just to everybody if they say to you it is essential that a great country should manufacture iron reply the most essential thing is that this great country should have iron if they say to you it is necessary that a great country should manufacture cloth reply it is more necessary that the citizens of this great country should have cloth if they say to you labor is wealth reply 
it is false. And by way of developing this, add, a bleeding is not health, and the proof of it is that it is done to restore health. If they say to you, to compel men to work over rocks and get an ounce of iron from a ton of ore is to increase their labor and consequently their wealth, reply, to compel men to dig wells by denying them the use of river water is to add to their useless labor, but not to their wealth. If they say to you, the sun gives his heat and light without requiring remuneration, reply, so much the better for me, since it costs me nothing to see distinctly. And if they reply to you, industry in general loses what you would have paid for lights, reply, no, for having paid nothing to the sun, I use that which it saves me in paying for clothes, furniture, and candles. So, if they say to you, these English rascals have capital which pays them nothing, reply, so much the better for us, they will not make us pay interest. If they say to you, these perfidious Englishmen find iron and coal at the same spot, reply, so much the better for us, they will not make us pay anything for bringing them together. If they say to you, the Swiss have rich pastures, which cost little, reply, the advantage is on our side for they will ask for a lesser quantity of our labor to furnish our farmers' oxen and our stomachs' food. If they say to you, the lands in the Crimea are worth nothing, and pay no taxes, reply, the gain is on our side, since we buy grain free from those charges. If they say to you, the serfs of Poland work without wages, reply, the loss is theirs, and the gain is ours, since their labor is deducted from the price of the grain which their masters sell us. Then, if they say to you, Other nations have many advantages over us, reply, By exchange they are forced to let us share in them. If they say to you, With liberty we shall be swamped with bread, beef, a la mode, coal, and coats, reply, we shall be neither cold nor hungry. If they say to you, With what shall we pay? Reply, Do not be troubled about that. If we are to be inundated, it will be because we are able to pay. If we cannot pay, we will not be inundated. If they say to you, I would allow free trade, if a stranger in bringing us one thing, took away another, but he will carry off our specie, reply, neither specie nor coffee grow in the fields of buse or come out of the manufactories of Elbeuf. For us to pay a foreigner with specie is like paying him with coffee. If they say to you, eat meat, reply, let it come in. If they say to you, like the pressa, when you have not the money to buy bread with, buy beef, reply, this advice is as wise as that of Voltaire to his tenant. If a person has not money to pay his rent with, he ought to have a house of his own. If they say to you, like the pressa, the state ought to teach the people why and how it should eat meat, reply, only let the state allow the meat free entrance, and the most civilized people in the world are old enough to learn to eat it without any teacher. If they say to you, the state ought to know everything, and foresee everything, to guide the people, and the people have only to let themselves be guided. Reply, is there a state outside of the people, and a human foresight outside of humanity? Archimedes might have repeated all the days of his life, with a lever and a fulcrum I will move the world, but he could not have moved it for want of those two things. The fulcrum of the state is the nation and nothing is madder than to build so many hopes on the state, that is to say, to assume a collective science and foresight, after having established individual folly and short-sightedness. If they say to you, My God, I ask no favors, but only a duty on grain and meat, which may compensate for the heavy taxes to which France is subjected, a mere little duty, 
equal to what these taxes add to the cost of my grain. Reply, a thousand pardons, but I too pay taxes. If, then, the protection which you vote yourself results in burdening for me, your grain, with your proportion of the taxes, your insinuating demand, aims at nothing less than the establishment between us of the following arrangement, thus worded by yourself. Since the public burdens are heavy, I who sell grain will pay nothing at all, and you, my neighbor, the buyer, shall pay two parts, to it, your share and mine. My neighbor, the grain dealer, you may have power on your side, but not reason. If they say to you, it is, however, very hard for me, a taxpayer, to compete in my own market with foreigners who pay none. Reply, first, this is not your market, but our market. I who live on grain, and pay for it, must be counted for something. Secondly, few foreigners at this time are free from taxes. Thirdly, if the tax which you vote repays to you, in roads, canals, and safety, more than it costs you, you are not justified in driving away, at my expense, the competition of foreigners who do not pay the tax, but who do not have the safety, roads, and canals. It is the same as saying, I want a compensating duty because I have fine clothes, stronger horses, and better plows than the Russian laborer. Fourthly, if the tax does not repay what it costs, do not vote it. Fifthly, if after you have voted a tax, it is your pleasure to escape its operation, invent a system which will throw it on foreigners. But the tariff only throws your proportion on me, when I already have enough of my own. If they say to you, freedom of commerce is necessary among the Russians, that they may exchange their products with advantage. Opinion of M. Thierre, April 1847. Reply, this freedom is necessary everywhere, and for the same reason. If they say to you, each country has its wants, it is according to that, that it must act. M. Thierre. Reply, it is according to that, that it acts of itself, when no one hinders it. If they say to you, since we have no sheet iron, its admission must be allowed. M. Thierre. Reply, thank you kindly. If they say to you, our merchant marine must have freight, owing to the lack of return cargoes, our vessels cannot compete with foreign ones. Reply, when you want to do everything at home, you can have cargoes neither going nor coming. It is as absurd to wish for a navy under a prohibitory system as to wish for carts where all transportation is forbidden. If they say to you, supposing that protection is unjust, everything is founded on it, there are monies invested, and rights acquired, and it cannot be abandoned without suffering, reply, every injustice profits someone, except, perhaps, restriction, which in the long run profits no one and to use as an argument the disturbance which the cessation of the injustice causes to the person profiting by it, is to say that an injustice, only because it has existed for a moment, should be eternal. End of section 16. Recording by Katie Riley. May 2010. Section 17 of Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastiat. Translated by Horace White. Section 17. 16 the right and the left hand. Report to the king. Sire, when we see these men of the Libra exchange audaciously disseminating their doctrines and maintaining that the right of buying and selling is implied by that of ownership, 
a piece of insolence that M. Billaud has criticized like a true lawyer, we may be allowed to entertain serious fears as to the destiny of national labor. For what will Frenchmen do with their arms and intelligences when they are free? The ministry which you have honored with your confidence has naturally paid great attention to so serious a subject, and has sought in its wisdom for a protection which might be substituted for that which appears compromised. It proposes to you to forbid your faithful subjects the use of the right hand. Sire, do not wrong us so far as to think that we lightly adopted a measure which, at the first glance, may appear odd. Deep study of the protective system has revealed to us this syllogism on which it entirely rests. The more one labors, the richer one is. The more difficulties one has to conquer, the more one labors. Ergo, the more difficulties one has to conquer, the richer one is. What is protection, really, but an ingenious application of this formal reasoning, which is so compact that it would resist the subtlety of M. Billot himself? Let us personify the country. Let us look on it as a collective being, with thirty million mouths, and consequently sixty million arms. This being makes a clock, which he proposes to exchange in Belgium for ten quintals of iron. But, we say to him, make the iron yourself. I cannot, says he, it would take me too much time, and I could not make five quintals while I can make one clock. Utopist, we reply, for this very reason we forbid your making the clock, and order you to make the iron. Do not you see that we create your labor? Sire, it will not have escaped your sagacity, that it is just as if we said to the country, Labor with the left hand, and not with the right. The creation of obstacles to furnish labor an opportunity to develop itself is the principle of the restriction, which is dying. It is also the principle of the restriction which is about to be created. Sire, to make such regulations is not to innovate, but to preserve. The efficacy of the measure is incontestable. It is difficult, much more difficult than one thinks, to do with the left hand what one was accustomed to do with the right. You will convince yourself of it, sire, if you will condescend to try our system on something which is familiar to you, like shuffling cards, for instance. We can then flatter ourselves that we have opened an illimitable career to labor. When workmen of all kinds are reduced to their left hands, consider, sire, the immense number that will be required to meet the present consumption, supposing it to be invariable, which we always do when we compare differing systems of production. So prodigious a demand for manual labor cannot fail to bring about a considerable increase in wages and pauperism will disappear from the country as if by enchantment. Sire, your paternal heart will rejoice at the thought that the benefits of this regulation will extend over that interesting portion of the great family whose fate excites your liveliest solicitude. What is the destiny of women in France? That sex, which is the boldest and most hardened to fatigue, is insensibly driving them all from fields of labor. Formerly they found a refuge in the lottery offices. These have been closed by a pitiless philanthropy. And under what pretext? To save, said they, the money of the poor. Alas, has a poor man ever obtained from a piece of money enjoyments as sweet and innocent as those which the mysterious urn of fortune contained for him? Cut off from all the sweets of life, how many delicious hours did he introduce into the bosom of his family when, every two weeks, he put the value of a day's labor on a quartern? Hope had always her place at the domestic hearth. The garret was peopled with illusions. The wife promised herself that she would eclipse her neighbors with the splendor of her attire. The son saw himself drum major, and the daughter felt herself carried towards the altar in the arms of her betrothed. To have a beautiful dream is certainly something. The lottery was the poetry of the poor, and we have allowed it to escape them. The lottery dead, 
what means have we of providing for our protégés, tobacco, and the postal service? Tobacco, certainly, it progresses, thanks to heaven, and the distinguished habits which august examples have been enabled to introduce among our elegant youth. But the postal service, we will say nothing of that, but make it the subject of a special report. Then what is left to your female subjects except tobacco? Nothing, except embroidery, knitting, and sewing, pitiful resources, which are more and more restricted by that barbarous science, mechanics. But as soon as your ordinance has appeared, as soon as the right hands are cut off or tied up, everything will change face. Twenty, thirty times more embroiderers, washers and ironers, seamstresses and shirt-makers, would not meet the consumption, honai soi ki mal wai pens, of the kingdom, always assuming that it is invariable, according to our way of reasoning. It is true that this supposition might be denied by cold-blooded theorists, for dresses and shirts would be dearer. But they say the same thing of the iron which France gets from our mines, compared to the vintage it could get on our hillsides. This argument can, therefore, be no more entertained against left-handedness than against protection. For this very dearness is the result and the sign of the excess of efforts and of labors, which is precisely the basis on which, in one case as in the other, we claim to found the prosperity of the working classes. Yes, we make a touching picture of the prosperity of the sewing business. What movement, what activity, what life? Each dress will busy a hundred fingers instead of ten. No longer will there be an idle young girl. And we need not, sire, point out to your perspicacity the moral results of this great revolution. Not only will there be more women employed, but each one of them will earn more, for they cannot meet the demand, and if competition still shows itself, it will no longer be among the working women who make the dresses, but the beautiful ladies who wear them. You see, sire, that our proposition is not only conformable to the economic traditions of the government, but it is also essentially moral and democratic. To appreciate its effect, let us suppose it realized— let us transport ourselves in thought into the future. Let us imagine the system in action for twenty years. Idleness is banished from the country. Ease and concord, contentment and morality, have entered all families together with labor. There is no more misery and no more prostitution. The left hand being very clumsy at its work, there is a superabundance of labor, and the pay is satisfactory. Everything is based on this and, as a consequence, the workshops are filled. Is it not true, sire, that if utopians were to suddenly demand the freedom of the right hand, they would spread alarm throughout the country? Is it not true that this pretended reform would overthrow all existences? Then our system is good, since it cannot be overthrown without causing great distress. However, we have a sad presentiment, that some day, so great is the perversity of man, an association will be organized to secure the liberty of right hands. It seems to us that we already hear these free right-handers speak as follows in the Salle Montesquieu. People, you believe yourselves richer because they have taken from you one hand. You see but the increase of labor which results to you from it. But look also at the dearness it causes and the forced decrease in the consumption of all articles. This measure has not made capital, which is the source of wages, more abundant. The waters which flow from this great reservoir are directed into other channels. The quantity is not increased, and the definite result is, for the nation, as a whole, a loss of comfort equal to the excess of the production of several millions of right hands, over several millions of left hands. Then let us form a league, and at the expense of some inevitable disturbances, let us conquer the right of working with both hands. Happily, sire, there will be organized an association for the defense of left-handed labor, and the sinistrists will have no trouble in reducing to nothing all these generalities and realities, suppositions and abstractions, reveries and utopias. 
they need only to exhume the Moniteur Industrial of 1846, and they will find, ready-made, arguments against free trade, which destroy so admirably this liberty of the right hand, that all that is required is to substitute one word for another. The Parisian Free Trade League never doubted but that it would have the assistance of the working men. But the working men can no longer be led by the nose. They have their eyes open, and they know political economy better than our diplomat professors. Free trade, they replied, will take from us our labor, and labor is our real, great, sovereign property. With labor, with much labor, the price of articles of merchandise is never beyond reach. But without labor, even if bread should cost but a penny a pound, the workingman is compelled to die of hunger. Now your doctrines, instead of increasing the amount of labor in France, diminish it. That is to say, you reduce us to misery. Number of October 13, 1846 It is true that when there are too many manufactured articles to sell, their price falls. But as wages decrease, when these articles sink in value, the result is that instead of being able to buy them, we can buy nothing. Thus, when they are cheapest, the working man is most unhappy. Gautier de Rumilly, Monetaire Industrielle, of November 17. It would not be ill for the sinistrists to mingle some threats with their beautiful theories. This is a sample. What? to desire to substitute the labor of the right hand for that of the left, and thus to cause a forced reduction, if not an annihilation of wages, the sole resource of almost the entire nation. And this at the moment when poor harvests already impose painful sacrifices on the working man, disquiet him as to his future, and make him more accessible to bad counsels, and ready to abandon the wise course of conduct he had hitherto adhered to. We are confident, sire, that thanks to such wise reasonings, if a struggle takes place, the left hand will come out of it victorious. Perhaps also an association will be formed in order to ascertain whether the right and the left hand are not both wrong, and if there is not a third hand between them in order to conciliate all. After having described the dexterists, as seduced by the apparent liberality of a principle, the correctness of which has not yet been verified by experience, and the sinistrists, as encamping in the position they have gained, it will say, and yet they deny that there is a third course to pursue in the midst of the conflict, and they do not see that the working classes have to defend themselves, at the same moment, against those who wish to change nothing in the present situation, because they find their advantage in it, and against those who dream of an economic revolution, of which they have calculated neither the extent nor the significance. National of October 16. We do not desire, however, to hide from your majesty the fact that our plan has a vulnerable side. They may say to us, in twenty years all left hands will be as skilled as right ones are now, and you can no longer count on left-handedness to increase the national labor. We reply to this, that according to learned physicians, the left side of the body has a natural weakness, which is very reassuring for the future of labor. Finally, sire, consent to sign the law, and a great principle will have prevailed. All wealth comes from the intensity of labor. It will be easy for us to extend it, and vary its application. We will declare, for instance, that it shall be allowable to work only with the feet, this is no more impossible, for there have been instances, than to extract iron from the mud of the sign. There have even been men who wrote with their backs. You see, sire, that we do not lack means of increasing national labor. If they do begin to fail us, there remains the boundless resource of amputation. If this report, sire, was not intended for publication, we would call your attention to the great influence which systems analogous to the one we submit to you, are capable of giving to men in power. But this is a subject which we reserve for consideration in private counsel. 17. Supremacy by Labor 
as in a time of war supremacy is attained by superiority in arms can in a time of peace supremacy be secured by superiority in labor this question is of the greatest interest at a time when no one seems to doubt that in the field of industry as on that of battle the stronger crushes the weaker this must result from the discovery of some sad and discouraging analogy between labor which exercises itself on things and violence which exercises itself on men for how could these two things be identical in their effects if they were opposed in their nature and if it is true that in manufacturing as in war supremacy is the necessary result of superiority why need we occupy ourselves with progress or social economy since we are in a world where all has been so arranged by providence that one and the same result oppression necessarily flows from the most antagonistic principles referring to the new policy toward which commercial freedom is drawing england many persons make this objection which i admit occupies the sincerest minds is england doing anything more than pursuing the same end by different means does she not constantly aspire to universal supremacy sure of the superiority of her capital and labor does she not call in free competition to stifle the industry of the continent reign as a sovereign and conquer the privilege of feeding and clothing the ruined peoples it would be easy for me to demonstrate that these alarms are chimerical that our pretended inferiority is greatly exaggerated that all our great branches of industry not only resist foreign competition but develop themselves under its influence and that its infallible effect is to bring about an increase in general consumption capable of absorbing both foreign and domestic products today i desire to attack this objection directly leaving it all its power and the advantage of the ground it has chosen putting english and french on one side i will try to find out in a general way if even though by superiority in one branch of industry one nation has crushed out similar industrial pursuits in another one this nation has made a step toward supremacy and that one toward dependence in other words if both do not gain by the operation and if the conquered do not gain the most by it if we see in any product but a cause of labor it is certain that the alarm of the protectionists is well founded if we consider iron for instance only in connection with the masters of forges it might be feared that the competition of a country where iron was a gratuitous gift of nature would extinguish the furnaces of another country where oil and fuel were scarce but is this a complete view of the subject are there relations only between iron and those who make it has it none with those who use it is its definite and only destination to be produced and if it is useful not on account of the labor which it causes but on account of the qualities which it possesses and the numerous services for which its hardness and malleability fit it does it not follow that foreigners cannot reduce its price even so far as to prevent its production among us without doing us more good under the last statement of the case than it injures us under the first please consider well that there are many things which foreigners owing to the natural advantages which surround them hinder us from producing directly and in regard to which we are placed in reality in the hypothetical position which we examined relative to iron we produce at home neither tea coffee gold nor silver does it follow that our labor as a whole is thereby diminished no only to create the equivalent of these things to acquire them by way of exchange we detach from our general labor a smaller portion than we would require to produce them ourselves more remains to us to use for other things we are so much the richer and stronger all that external rivalry can do even in cases where it absolutely keeps us from any certain form of labor is to encourage our labor and increase our productive power is that the road to supremacy for foreigners 
If a mine of gold were to be discovered in France, it does not follow that it would be for our interests to work it. It is even certain that the enterprise ought to be neglected, if each ounce of gold absorbed more of our labor than an ounce of gold bought in Mexico with cloth. In this case, it would be better to keep on seeing our mines in our manufactories. What is true of gold is true of iron. The illusion comes from the fact that one thing is not seen. That is, that foreign superiority prevents national labor, only under some certain form, and makes it superfluous under this form, but by putting at our disposal the very result of the labor thus annihilated. If men lived in diving bells under the water, and had to provide themselves with air by the use of pumps, there would be an immense source of labor. To destroy this labor, leaving men in this condition, would be to do them a terrible injury. But if labor ceases, because the necessity for it has gone, because men are placed in another position, where air reaches their lungs without an effort, then the loss of this labor is not to be regretted, except in the eyes of those who appreciate in labor, only the labor itself. It is exactly this sort of labor which machines, commercial freedom, and progress of all sorts, gradually annihilate. Not useful labor, but labor which has become superfluous, supernumerary, objectless, and without result. On the other hand, protection restores it to activity. It replaces us under the water, so as to give us an opportunity of pumping. It forces us to ask for gold from the inaccessible national mine, rather than from our national manufactories. All its effect is summed up in this phrase, loss of power. It must be understood that I speak here of general effects, and not of the temporary disturbances occasioned by the transition from a bad to a good system. A momentary disarrangement necessarily accompanies all progress. This may be a reason for making the transition a gentle one, but not for systematically interdicting all progress, and still less for misunderstanding it. They represent industry to us as a conflict. This is not true, or is true only when you confine yourself to considering each branch of industry in its effects on some similar branch, in isolating both in the mind from the rest of humanity. But there is something else. There are its effects on consumption and the general well-being. This is the reason why it is not allowable to assimilate labor to war as they do. In war, the strongest overwhelms the weakest. In labor, the strongest gives strength to the weakest. This radically destroys the analogy. Though the English are strong and skilled, possess immense invested capital, and have at their disposal the two great powers of production, iron and fire, all this is converted into the cheapness of the product. And who gains by the cheapness of the product? He who buys it. It is not in their power to absolutely annihilate any portion of our labor. All that they can do is to make it superfluous through some result acquired, to give air at the same time that they suppress the pump, to increase thus the force at our disposal, and, which is a remarkable thing, to render their pretended supremacy more impossible, as their superiority becomes more undeniable. Thus, by a rigorous and consoling demonstration, we reach this conclusion, that labor and violence, so opposed in their nature, are, whatever socialists and protectionists may say, no less so in their effects. All we required to do that was to distinguish between annihilated labor and economized labor. Having less iron because one works less, or having more iron although one works less, are things which are more than different. They are opposites. The protectionists confound them, we do not, that is all. Be convinced of one thing, if the English bring into play much activity, labor, capital, intelligence, and natural force, it is not for the love of us, 
it is to give themselves many comforts in exchange for their products. They certainly desire to receive at least as much as they give, and they make at home the payment for that which they buy elsewhere. If, then, they inundate us with their products, it is because they expect to be inundated with ours. In this case, the best way to have much for ourselves is to be free to choose between these two methods of production, direct production or indirect production. All the British Machiavellism cannot lead us to make a bad choice. Let us then stop assimilating industrial competition with war, a false assimilation, which is specious only when two rival branches of industry are isolated, in order to judge of the effects of competition. As soon as the effect produced on the general well-being is taken into consideration, the analogy disappears. In a battle, he who is killed is thoroughly killed, and the army is weakened just that much. In manufactures, one manufactory succumbs only so far as the total of national labor replaces what it produced with an excess. Imagine a state of affairs where, for one man, stretched on the plain, two spring up full of force and vigor. If there is a planet where such things happen, it must be admitted that war is carried on there under conditions so different from those which obtain here below that it does not even deserve that name. Now this is the distinguishing character of what they have so inappropriately called an industrial war. Let the Belgians and the English reduce the price of their iron, if they can, and keep on reducing it until they bring it down to nothing. They may thereby put out one of our furnaces, kill one of our soldiers. But I defy them to hinder a thousand other industries, more profitable than the disabled one, immediately, and as a necessary consequence of this very cheapness, resuscitating and developing themselves. Let us decide that supremacy by labor is impossible and contradictory, since all superiority which manifests itself among a people is converted into cheapness, and results only in giving force to all others. Let us then banish from political economy all these expressions borrowed from the vocabulary of battles, to struggle with equal arms, to conquer, to crush out, to stifle, to be beaten, invasion, tribute. What do these words mean? Squeeze them and nothing comes out of them. We are mistaken. There come from them absurd errors and fatal prejudices. These are the words which stop the blending of peoples, their peaceful, universal, indissoluble alliance, and the progress of humanity. End of section 17. Recording by Katie Riley. May 2010. Section 18 of Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastia. Translated by Horace White. Section 18. Part 3. Spoilation and Law. To the protectionists of the General Council of Manufacturers. Gentlemen, let us for a few moments interchange moderate and friendly opinions. You are not willing that political economy should believe and teach free trade. This is as though you were to say, we are not willing that political economy should occupy itself with society, exchange, value, law, justice, property. We recognize only two principles, oppression and spoliation. Can you possibly conceive of political economy without society, or of society without exchange, or of exchange without a relative value between two articles, or the two services exchanged? Can you possibly conceive the idea of value 
except as the result of the free consent of the exchangers. Can you conceive of one product being worth another, if in the barter, one of the parties is not free? Is it possible for you to conceive of the free consent of two parties without liberty? Can you possibly conceive that one of the contracting parties is deprived of his liberty, unless he is oppressed by the other? Can you possibly conceive of an exchange between an oppressor and one oppressed, unless the equivalence of the services is altered, or unless, as a consequence, law, justice, and the rights of property have been violated? What do you really want? Answer frankly. You are not willing that trade should be free. You desire then that it shall not be free? You desire then that trade shall be carried on under the influence of oppression? For if it is not carried on under the influence of oppression, it will be carried on under the influence of liberty, and that is what you do not desire. Admit then that it is law and justice which embarrass you, that that which troubles you is property, not your own to be sure, but another's. You are altogether unwilling to allow others to freely dispose of their own property, the essential condition of ownership, but you well understand how to dispose of your own, and of theirs. And, accordingly, you ask the political economists to arrange this mass of absurdities and monstrosities in a definite and well-ordered system, to establish, in accordance with your practice, the theory of spoliation. But they will never do it, for, in their eyes, spoliation is a principle of hatred and disorder, and the most particularly odious form which it can assume is the legal form. And here, Mr. Benoit Diazzi, I take you to task. You are moderate, impartial, and generous. You are willing to sacrifice your interests and your fortune. This you constantly declare. Recently, in the general council, you said, If the rich had only to abandon their wealth to make the people rich, we should all be ready to do it. Here, here, it is true. And yesterday, in the National Assembly, you said, If I believed that it was in my power to give to the workingmen all the work they need, I would give all I possess to realize this blessing. Unfortunately, it is impossible. Although it pains you that the sacrifice is so useless that it should not be made, and you exclaim with Basil, Money, money, I detest it, but I will keep it. Assuredly, no one will question a generosity so retentive, however barren. It is a virtue which loves to envelop itself in a veil of modesty, especially when it is purely latent and negative. As for you, you will lose no opportunity to proclaim it in the ears of all France, from the tribune of the Luxembourg to the Palais Legislative. But no one desires you to abandon your fortune, and I admit that it would not solve the social problem. You wish to be generous, but cannot. I only venture to ask that you will be just. Keep your fortune, but permit me also to keep mine. Respect my property as I respect yours. Is this too bold a request on my part? Suppose we lived in a country under a free trade regime, where every one could dispose of his property and his labor at pleasure. Does this make your hair stand? Reassure yourself. This is only an hypothesis. One would then be as free as the other. There would indeed be a law in the code, but this law, impartial and just, would not infringe our liberty, but would guarantee it, and it would take effect only when we sought to oppress each other. There would be officers of the law, magistrates and police, but they would only execute the law. Under such a state of affairs, suppose that you owned an iron foundry, and that I was a hatter. I should need iron for my business. Naturally, I should seek to solve this problem. How shall I best procure the iron necessary for my business, with the least possible amount of labor? Considering my situation and my means of knowledge, 
I should discover that the best thing for me to do would be to make hats, and sell them to a Belgian who would give me iron in exchange. But you, being the owner of an iron foundry, and considering my case, would say to yourself, I shall be obliged to compel that fellow to come to my shop. You, accordingly, take your sword and pistols, and arming your numerous retinue, proceed to the frontier, and, at the moment I am engaged in making my trade, you cry out to me, Stop that, or I will blow your brains out. But, my lord, I am in need of iron. I have it to sell. But, sir, you ask too much for it. I have my reasons for that. But, my good sir, I also have my reasons for preferring cheaper iron. Well, we shall see who shall decide between your reasons and mine. Soldiers, advance. In short, you forbid the entry of Belgian iron, and prevent the export of my hats. Under the condition of things which we have supposed, that is, under a regime of liberty, you cannot deny that that would be, on your part, manifestly an act of oppression and spoliation. Accordingly, I should resort to the law, the magistrate, and the power of the government. They would intervene. You would be tried, condemned, and justly punished. But this circumstance would suggest to you a bright idea. You would say to yourself, I have been very simple to give myself so much trouble. What? Place myself in a position where I must kill someone, or be killed? Degrade myself? Put my domestics under arms? Incur heavy expenses? Give myself the character of a robber? And render myself liable to the laws of the country? And all this in order to compel a miserable hatter to come to my foundry, to buy iron at my price? What if I should make the interest of the law, of the magistrate, of the public authorities, my interests? What if I could get them to perform the odious act on the frontier, which I was about to do myself? Enchanted by this pleasing prospect, you secure a nomination to the chambers, and obtain the passage of a law conceived in the following terms. Section 1. There shall be a tax levied upon everybody, but especially upon that cursed hat-maker. Section 2. The proceeds of this tax shall be applied to the payment of men to guard the frontier in the interest of iron founders. Section 3. It shall be their duty to prevent the exchange of hats or other articles of merchandise with the Belgians for iron. Section 4. The ministers of the government, the prosecuting attorneys, jailers, custom officers, and all officials, are entrusted with the execution of this law. I admit, sir, that in this form robbery would be far more lucrative, more agreeable, and less perilous than under the arrangements which you had at first determined upon. You could most assuredly laugh in your sleeve, for you would then have saddled all the expenses upon me. But I affirm that you would have introduced into society a vicious principle, a principle of immorality, of disorder, of hatred, and of incessant revolutions, that you would have prepared the way for all the various schemes of socialism and communism. You, doubtless, find my hypothesis a very bold one. Well, then, let us reverse the case. I consent for the sake of the demonstration. Suppose that I am a laborer, and you an iron founder. It would be a great advantage to me to buy hatchets cheap, and even to get them for nothing. And I know that there are hatchets and saws in your establishment. Accordingly, without any ceremony, I enter your warehouse, and seize everything that I can lay my hands upon. But, in the exercise of your legitimate right of self-defense, you at first resist force with force, afterwards invoking the power of the law, the magistrate and the constables, you throw me into prison, and you do well. Oh, ho! The thought suggests itself to me that I have been very awkward in this business. 
when a person wishes to enjoy the property of other people, he will, unless he is a fool, act in accordance with the law, and not in violation of it. Consequently, just as you have made yourself a protectionist, I will make myself a socialist. Since you have laid claim to the right to profit, I claim the right to labor, or to the instruments of labor. For the rest, I read my Louis Blanc in prison, and I know by heart this doctrine. In order to disenthrall themselves, the common people have need of tools to work with. It is the function of the government to provide them. And again, if one admits that, in order to be really free, a man requires the ability to exercise and to develop his faculties, the result is that society owes each of its members instruction, without which the human mind is incapable of development, and the instruments of labor, without which human activities have no field for their exercise. But by what means can society give to each one of its members the necessary instruction and the necessary instruments of labor, except by the intervention of the state? So that, if it becomes necessary to revolutionize the country, I also will force my way into the halls of legislation. I also will pervert the law, and make it perform in my behalf, and at your expense, the very act for which it just now punished me. My decree is molded after yours. Section 1. There shall be taxes levied upon every citizen, and especially upon iron founders. Section 2. The proceeds of this tax shall be applied to the creation of armed corps, to which the title of the Fraternal Constabulary shall be given. Section 3. It shall be the duty of the Fraternal Constabulary to make their way into the warehouses of hatchets, saws, etc., to take possession of these tools, and to distribute them to such working men as may desire them. Thanks to this ingenious device, you see, my lord, that I shall no longer be obliged to bear the risks, the costs, the odium, or the scruples of robbery. The state will rob for me as it has for you. We shall both be playing the same game. It remains to be seen what would be the condition of French society on the realization of my second hypothesis, or what, at least, is the condition of it after the almost complete realization of the first hypothesis. I do not desire to discuss here the economy of the question. It is generally believed that in advocating free trade we are exclusively influenced by the desire to allow capital and labor to take the direction most advantageous to them. This is an error. This consideration is merely secondary. That which wounds, afflicts, and is revolting to us in the protective system is the denial of right, of justice, of property. It is the fact that the system turns the law against justice and against property when it ought to protect them. It is that it undermines and perverts the very conditions of society. And to the question in this aspect, I invite your most serious consideration. What is law, or at least what ought it to be? What is its rational and moral mission? Is it not to hold the balance even between all rights, all liberties, and all property? Is it not to cause justice to rule among all? Is it not to prevent and to repress oppression and robbery wherever they are found? And are you not shocked at the immense, radical, and deplorable innovation introduced into the world by compelling the law itself to commit the very crimes, to punish which is its especial mission, by turning the law in principle, and in fact, against liberty and property? You deplore the condition of modern society. You groan over the disorder which prevails in institutions and ideas. But is it not your system which has perverted everything, both institutions and ideas? What? The law is no longer the refuge of the oppressed, but the arm of the oppressor. The law is no longer a shield, but a sword. 
the law no longer holds in her august hands a scale, but false weights and measures. And you wish to have society well regulated. Your system has written over the entrance of the legislative halls these words. Whoever acquires any influence here can obtain his share of the legalized pillage. And what has been the result? All classes of society have become demoralized by shouting around the gates of the palace, Give me a share of the spoils. After the revolution of February, when universal suffrage was proclaimed, I had for a moment hoped to have heard this sentiment. No more pillage for any one, justice for all. And that would have been the real solution of the social problem. Such was not the case. The doctrine of protection had for generations too profoundly corrupted the age, public sentiments, and ideas. No, in making inroads upon the National Assembly, each class, in accordance with your system, has endeavored to make the law an instrument of rapine. There have been demanded heavier imposts, gratuitous credit, the right to employment, the right to assistance, the guarantee of incomes and of minimum wages, gratuitous instruction, loans to industry, etc., etc. In short, every one has endeavored to live and thrive at the expense of others. And upon what have these pretensions been based? Upon the authority of your precedents. What sophisms have been invoked? Those that you have propagated for two centuries. With you have they talked about equalizing the conditions of labor. With you they have declaimed against ruinous competition. With you they have ridiculed the let-alone principle, that is to say, liberty. With you they have said that the law should not confine itself to being just, but should come to the aid of suffering industries, protect the feeble against the strong, secure profits to individuals at the expense of the community, etc., etc. In short, according to the expression of Mr. Charles Dupin, socialism has come to establish the theory of robbery. It has done what you have done, and that which you desire the professors of political economy to do for you. Your cleverness is in vain, Messieurs Protectionists. It is useless to lower your tone, to boast of your latent generosity, or to deceive your opponents by sentiment. You cannot prevent logic from being logic. You cannot prevent Mr. Ballot from telling the legislators, You have granted favors to one, you must grant them to all. You cannot prevent Mr. Cremieux from telling the legislators, You have enriched the manufacturers, you must enrich the common people. You cannot prevent Mr. Nadeau from saying to the legislators, You cannot refuse to do for the suffering classes that which you have done for the privileged classes. You cannot even prevent the leader of your orchestra, Mr. Mimerel, from saying to the legislators, I demand 25,000 subsidies for the workingmen's savings banks, and supporting his motion in this manner. Is this the first example of the kind that our legislation offers? Would you establish the system that the state should encourage everything? Open, at its expense, courses of scientific lectures, subsidize the fine arts, pension the theater, give to the classes already favored by fortune the benefits of superior education, the most varied amusements, the enjoyment of the arts and repose for old age. Give all this to those who know nothing of privations, and compel those who have no share in these benefits to bear their part of the burden, while refusing them everything, even the necessaries of life. Gentlemen, our French society, our customs, our laws are so made that the intervention of the state, however much it may be regretted, is seen everywhere, and nothing seems to be stable or durable if the hand of the state is not manifest in it. It is the state that makes the Sevres porcelain and the goblin tapestry. It is the state that periodically gives expositions of the works of our artists, 
and of the products of our manufacturers. It is the state which recompenses those who raise its cattle and breed its fish. All this costs a great deal. It is a tax to which every one is obliged to contribute. Everybody, do you understand? And what direct benefit do the people derive from it? Of what direct benefit to the people are your porcelains and tapestries, and your expositions? This general principle of resisting what you call a state of enthusiasm we can understand. Although you yesterday voted a bounty for linens, we can understand it on the condition of consulting the present crisis, and especially on the condition of your proving your impartiality. If it is true that, by the means I have indicated, the state thus far seems to have more directly benefited the well-to-do classes than those who are poorer, it is necessary that this appearance should be removed. Shall it be done by closing the manufactories of tapestry and stopping the exhibitions? Assuredly not, but by giving the poor a direct share in this distribution of benefits. In this long catalogue of favours granted to some at the expense of all, one will remark the extreme prudence with which Mr. Mimrel has left the tariff favours out of sight, although they are the most explicit manifestations of legal spoliation. All the orators who supported or opposed him have taken upon themselves the same reserve. It is very shrewd, possibly they hope, by giving the poor a direct participation in this distribution of benefits, to save this great iniquity by which they profit, but of which they do not whisper. They deceive themselves. Do they suppose that after having realized a partial spoliation by the establishment of custom duties, other classes, by the establishment of other institutions, will not attempt to realize universal spoliation? I know very well you always have a sophism ready. You say, the favors which the law grants us are not given to the manufacturer, but to the manufacturers. The profits which it enables us to receive at the expense of the consumers are merely a trust placed in our hands. They enrich us, it is true, but our wealth places us in a position to expend more, to extend our establishments, and falls like refreshing dew upon the laboring classes. Such is your language, and what I most lament is the circumstance that your miserable sophisms have so perverted public opinion that they are appealed to in support of all forms of legalized spoliation. The suffering classes also say, let us, by act of the legislature, help ourselves to the goods of others. We shall be in easier circumstances as the result of it. We shall buy more wheat, more meat, more cloth, and more iron. And that which we receive from the public taxes will return in a beneficent shower to the capitalists and landed proprietors. But, as I have already said, I will not today discuss the economical effects of legal spoliation. Whenever the protectionists desire, they will find me ready to examine the sophisms of the ricochets, which indeed may be invoked in support of all species of robbery and fraud. We will confine ourselves to the political and moral effects of exchange legally deprived of liberty. I have said, the time has come to know what the law is, and what it ought to be. If you make the law for all citizens a palladium of liberty and of property, if it is only the organization of the individual law of self-defense, you will establish, upon the foundation of justice, a government rational, simple, economical, comprehended by all, loved by all, useful to all, supported by all, entrusted with a responsibility perfectly defined and carefully restricted, and endowed with imperishable strength. If, on the other hand, in the interests of individuals or of classes, you make the law an instrument of robbery, every one will wish to make laws, and to make them to his own advantage. There will be a riotous crowd at the doors of the legislative halls. There will be a bitter conflict within. Minds will be in anarchy. Morals will be shipwrecked. There will be violence in party organs, heated elections, accusations, recriminations, jealousies, 
inextinguishable hates, the public forces placed at the service of rapacity instead of repressing it, the ability to distinguish the true from the false effaced from all minds, as the notion of justice and injustice will be obliterated from all consciences, the government, responsible for everything and bending under the burden of its responsibilities, political convulsions, revolutions without end, ruins over which all forms of socialism and communism attempt to establish themselves, these are the evils which must necessarily flow from the perversion of law. Such, consequently, gentlemen, are the evils for which you have prepared the way by making use of the law to destroy freedom of exchange. That is to say, to abolish the right of property. Do not declaim against socialism. You establish it. Do not cry out against communism. You create it. And now you ask us economists to make you a theory which will justify you. Marbleu, make it yourselves. End of section 18. Recording by Katie Riley. May 2010. Section 19 of Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastiat. Translated by Horace White. Section 19. Part 4. Capital and Interest. My object in this treatise is to examine into the real nature of the interest of capital, for the purpose of proving that it is lawful, and explaining why it should be perpetual. This may appear singular, and yet I confess, I am more afraid of being too plain than too obscure. I am afraid I may weary the reader by a series of mere truisms. But it is no easy matter to avoid this danger, when the facts with which we have to deal are known to every one by personal, familiar, and daily experience. But then you will say, what is the use of this treatise? Why explain what everybody knows? But although this problem appears at first sight so very simple, there is more in it than you might suppose. I shall endeavor to prove this by an example. Maunder lends an instrument of labor today, which will be entirely destroyed in a week yet the capital will not produce the less interest to Maunder, or his heirs, through all eternity. Reader, can you honestly say that you understand the reason of this? It would be a waste of time to seek any satisfactory explanation from the writings of economists. They have not thrown much light upon the reasons of the existence of interest. For this they are not to be blamed, for at the time they wrote, its lawfulness was not called in question. Now, however, times are altered, the case is different. Men, who consider themselves to be in advance of their age, have organized an active crusade against capital and interest. It is the productiveness of capital which they are attacking, not certain abuses in the administration of it, but the principle itself. A journal has been established to serve as a vehicle for this crusade. It is conducted by M. Proudhon, and has, it is said, an immense circulation. The first number of this periodical contains the electoral manifesto of the people. Here we read, The productiveness of capital, which is condemned by Christianity under the name of usury, is the true cause of misery, the true principle of destitution, the eternal obstacle to the establishment of the Republic. Another journal, La Rouge Populaire, after having said some excellent things on labor, adds, But above all, labor ought to be free, that is, it ought to be organized in such a manner, that money lenders and patrons or masters should not be paid, for this liberty of labor, this right of labor, which is raised to so high a price by the traffickers of men. The only thought that I notice here is that expressed by the words in italics, 
which imply a denial of the right to interest. The remainder of the article explains it. It is thus that the democratic socialist, Thoré, expresses himself. The revolution will always have to be recommenced, so long as we occupy ourselves with consequences only, without having the logic or the courage to attack the principle itself. This principle is capital, false property, interest, and usury, which by the old regime is made to weigh upon labor. Ever since the aristocrats invented the incredible fiction, that capital possesses the power of reproducing itself, the workers have been at the mercy of the idol. At the end of a year, will you find an additional crown in a bag of one hundred shillings? At the end of fourteen years, will your shillings have doubled in your bag? Will a work of industry or of skill produce another at the end of fourteen years? Let us begin, then, by demolishing this fatal fiction. I have quoted the above merely for the sake of establishing the fact that many persons consider the productiveness of capital a false, a fatal, and an iniquitous principle. But quotations are superfluous. It is well known that the people attribute their sufferings to what they call the trafficking in man by man. In fact, the phrase tyranny of capital has become proverbial. I believe there is not a man in the world who is aware of the whole importance of this question. Is the interest of capital natural, just, and lawful, and as useful to the payer as to the receiver? You answer no, I answer yes. Then we differ entirely. But it is of the utmost importance to discover which of us is in the right, Otherwise we shall incur the danger of making a false solution of the question, a matter of opinion. If the error is on my side, however, the evil would not be so great. It must be inferred that I know nothing about the true interests of the masses, or the march of human progress, and that all my arguments are but as so many grains of sand, by which the car of the revolution will certainly not be arrested. But if, on the contrary, M. M. Proudhon and Thoré are deceiving themselves, it follows that they are leading the people astray, that they are showing them the evil where it does not exist, and thus giving a false direction to their ideas, to their antipathies, to their dislikes, and to their attacks. It follows that the misguided people are rushing into a horrible and absurd struggle, in which victory would be more fatal than defeat, since, according to this supposition, the result would be the realization of universal evils, the destruction of every means of emancipation, the consummation of its own misery. This is just what M. Proudhon has acknowledged, with perfect good faith. The foundation stone, he told me, of my system is the gratuitousness of credit. If I am mistaken in this, socialism is a vain dream. I add, it is a dream, in which the people are tearing themselves to pieces. Will it therefore be a cause for surprise, if, when they awake, they find themselves mangled and bleeding? Such a danger as this is enough to justify me fully, if, in the course of the discussion, I allow myself to be led into some trivialities and some prolixity." Capital and Interest I address this treatise to the workmen of Paris, more especially to those who have enrolled themselves under the banner of socialist democracy. I proceed to consider these two questions. First, is it consistent with the nature of things and with justice that capital should produce interest? Second, is it consistent with the nature of things and with justice that the interest of capital should be perpetual. The working men of Paris will certainly acknowledge that a more important subject could not be discussed. Since the world began, it has been allowed, at least in part, that capital ought to produce interest. But latterly it has been affirmed that herein lies the very social error which is the cause of pauperism and inequality. 
It is therefore very essential to know now on what ground we stand. For if levying interest from capital is a sin, the workers have a right to revolt against social order as it exists. It is in vain to tell them that they ought to have recourse to legal and pacific means. It would be a hypocritical recommendation. When on the one side there is a strong man, poor and a victim of robbery, on the other a weak man, but rich, and a robber, it is singular enough that we should say to the former, with a hope of persuading him, wait till your oppressor voluntarily renounces oppression, or till it shall cease of itself. This cannot be, and those who tell us that capital is, by nature, unproductive, ought to know that they are provoking a terrible and immediate struggle. If, on the contrary, the interest of capital is natural, lawful, consistent with the general good, as favorable to the borrower as to the lender, the economists who deny it, the tribunes who traffic in this pretended social wound, are leading the workmen into a senseless and unjust struggle, which can have no other issue than the misfortune of all. In fact, they are arming labor against capital. So much the better if these two powers are really antagonistic, and may the struggle soon be ended. But if they are in harmony, the struggle is the greatest evil which can be inflicted on society. You see, then, workmen, that there is not a more important question than this. Is the interest of capital lawful or not? In the former case, you must immediately renounce the struggle to which you are being urged. In the second, you must carry it on bravely, and to the end. Productiveness of capital. Perpetuity of interest. These are difficult questions. I must endeavor to make myself clear and for that purpose I shall have recourse to example rather than to demonstration, or rather, I shall place the demonstration in the example. I begin by acknowledging that at first sight it may appear strange that capital should pretend to a remuneration, and above all to a perpetual remuneration. You will say, here are two men, one of them works from morning till night, from one year's end to another, and if he consumes all which he has gained, even by superior energy, he remains poor. When Christmas comes, he is no forwarder than he was at the beginning of the year, and has no other prospect but to begin again. The other man does nothing, either with his hands or his head, or, at least, if he makes use of them at all, it is only for his own pleasure. It is allowable for him to do nothing, for he has an income, he does not work, yet he lives well. He has everything in abundance. Delicate dishes, sumptuous furniture, elegant equipages. Nay, he even consumes, daily, things which the workers have been obliged to produce, by the sweat of their brow. For these things do not make themselves. And, as far as he is concerned, he has had no hand in their production. It is the workmen who have caused this corn to grow, polished this furniture, woven these carpets. It is our wives and daughters who have spun, cut out, sewed, and embroidered these stuffs. We work, then, for him and for ourselves, for him first, and then for ourselves, if there is anything left. But here is something more striking still. If the former of these two men, the worker, consumes within the year any profit which may have been left him in that year, he is always at the point from which he started, and his destiny condemns him to move incessantly in a perpetual circle, and a monotony of exertion. Labor, then, is rewarded only once. But if the other, the gentleman, consumes his yearly income in the year, he has, the year after, in those which follow, and through all eternity, an income always equal, inexhaustible, perpetual. Capital, then, is remunerated, not only once or twice, but an indefinite number of times, so that, at the end of a hundred years, a family which has placed twenty thousand francs at five per cent, will have had one hundred thousand francs, and this will not prevent it from having a hundred thousand more 
in the following century. In other words, for 20,000 francs, which represent its labor, it will have levied, in two centuries, a tenfold value on the labor of others. In this social arrangement, is there not a monstrous evil to be reformed? And this is not all. If it should please this family to curtail its enjoyments a little, to spend, for example, only nine hundred francs instead of a thousand, it may, without any labor, without any other trouble beyond that of investing a hundred francs a year, increase its capital and its income in such rapid progression that it will soon be in a position to consume as much as a hundred families of industrious workmen. Does not all this go to prove that society itself has in its bosom a hideous cancer, which ought to be eradicated at the risk of some temporary suffering? These are, it appears to me, the sad and irritating reflections which must be excited in your minds by the active and superficial crusade which is being carried on against capital and interest. On the other hand, there are moments in which, I am convinced, doubts are awakened in your minds, and scruples in your conscience. You say to yourself sometimes, but to assert that capital ought not to produce interest, is to say that he who has created instruments of labor, or materials, or provisions of any kind, ought to yield them up without compensation. Is that just? And then if it is so, who would lend these instruments? these materials, these provisions. Who would take care of them? Who even would create them? Everyone would consume his proportion, and the human race would never advance a step. Capital would be no longer formed, since there would be no interest in forming it. It will become exceedingly scarce. A singular step toward gratuitous loans. A singular means of improving the condition of borrowers, to make it impossible for them to borrow at any price. What would become of labor itself? For there will be no money advanced, and not one single kind of labor can be mentioned, and not even the chase, which can be purchased without money in hand. As for ourselves, what would become of us? What, we are not to be allowed to borrow, in order to work in the prime of life, nor to lend, that we may enjoy repose in its decline? The law will rob us of the prospect of laying by a little property, because it will prevent us from gaining any advantage from it. It will deprive us of all stimulus to save at the present time, and of all hope of repose for the future. It is useless to exhaust ourselves with fatigue. We must abandon the idea of leaving our sons and daughters a little property, since modern science renders it useless. For we should become traffickers in men if we were to lend it on interest. Alas! The world which these persons would open before us as an imaginary good is still more dreary and desolate than that which they condemn, for hope, at any rate, is not banished from the latter. Thus in all respects and in every point of view, the question is a serious one. Let us hasten to arrive at a solution. Our civil code has a chapter entitled, On the Manner of Transmitting Property. I do not think it gives a very complete nomenclature on this point. When a man by his labor has made some useful things, in other words, when he has created a value, it can only pass into the hands of another by one of the following modes. As a gift, by the right of inheritance, by exchange, loan, or theft. One word upon each of these, except the last, although it plays a greater part in the world than we may think. A gift needs no definition. It is essentially voluntary and spontaneous. It depends exclusively upon the giver, and the receiver cannot be said to have any right to it. Without a doubt, morality and religion make it a duty for men, especially the rich, to deprive themselves voluntarily of that which they possess, in favor of their less fortunate brethren. But this is an entirely moral obligation. If it were to be asserted on principle, admitted in practice, or sanctioned by law, that every man has a right to the property of another, the gift would have no merit. Charity and gratitude would be no longer virtues. Besides, such a doctrine would suddenly and universally arrest labor and production, 
as severe cold congeals water and suspends animation. For who would work if there was no longer to be any connection between labor and the satisfying of our wants? Political economy has not treated of gifts. It has hence been concluded that it disowns them, and that it is therefore a science devoid of heart. This is a ridiculous accusation. That science which treats of the laws resulting from the reciprocity of services had no business to inquire into the consequences of generosity, with respect to him who receives, nor into its effects, perhaps still more precious, on him who gives. Such considerations belong evidently to the science of morals. We must allow the sciences to have limits. Above all, we must not accuse them of denying or undervaluing what they look on as foreign to their department. The right of inheritance, against which so much has been objected of late, is one of the forms of gift, and assuredly the most natural of all. That which a man has produced he may consume, exchange, or give. What can be more natural than that he should give it to his children? It is this power, more than any other, which inspires him with courage to labor and to save. Do you know why the principle of right of inheritance is thus called in question? Because it is imagined that the property thus transmitted is plundered from the masses. This is a fatal error. Political economy demonstrates, in the most peremptory manner, that all value produced is a creation which does no harm to any person whatever. For that reason, it may be consumed, and still more, transmitted, without hurting any one. But I shall not pursue these reflections, which do not belong to the subject. Exchange is the principal department of political economy because it is by far the most frequent method of transmitting property, according to the free and voluntary agreements of the laws and effects of which this science treats. Properly speaking, exchange is the reciprocity of services. The parties say between themselves, Give me this, and I will give you that, or Do this for me, and I will do that for you. It is well to remark for this will throw a new light on the notion of value, that the second form is always implied in the first. When it is said, Do this for me, and I will do that for you, an exchange of service for service is proposed. Again, when it is said, Give me this, and I will give you that, it is the same as saying, I yield to you what I have done, yield to me what you have done. The labor is past instead of present, but the exchange is not the less governed by the comparative valuation of the two services, so that it is quite correct to say that the principle of value is in the services rendered and received on accounts of the productions exchanged, rather than in productions themselves. In reality, services are scarcely ever exchanged directly. There is a medium, which is termed money. Paul has completed a coat, for which he wishes to receive a little bread, a little wine, a little oil, a visit from a doctor, a ticket for the play, etc. The exchange cannot be effected in kind. So what does Paul do? He first exchanges his coat for some money, which is called sale. Then he exchanges this money again for the things which he wants, which is called purchase. And now, only, has the reciprocity of services completed its circuit. Now, only, the labor and the compensation are balanced in the same individual. I have done this for society. It has done that for me. In a word, it is only now that the exchange is actually accomplished. Thus, nothing can be more correct than this observation of J. B. Say, since the introduction of money, every exchange is resolved into two elements, sale and purchase. It is the reunion of these two elements which renders the exchange complete. We must remark also that the constant appearance of money in every exchange has overturned and misled all our ideas. Men have ended in thinking that money was true riches, 
and that to multiply it was to multiply services and products. Hence the prohibitory system, hence paper money, hence the celebrated aphorism, what one gains the other loses, and all the errors which have ruined the earth and imbrued it with blood. After much research it has been found that in order to make the two services exchanged of equivalent value, and in order to render the exchange equitable, the best means was to allow it to be free. However plausible at first sight the intervention of the state might be, it was soon perceived that it is always oppressive to one or other of the contracting parties. When we look into these subjects, we are always compelled to reason upon this maxim, that equal value results from liberty. We have, in fact, no other means of knowing whether, at a given moment, two services are of the same value, but that of examining whether they can be readily and freely exchanged. Allow the state, which is the same thing as force, to interfere on one side or the other, and from that moment all means of appreciation will be complicated and entangled, instead of becoming clear. It ought to be the part of the state to prevent, and above all, to repress artifice and fraud. That is, to secure liberty, and not to violate it. I have enlarged a little upon exchange, although loan is my principal object. My excuse is, that I conceive that there is in loan an actual exchange, an actual service rendered by the lender, and which makes the borrower liable to an equivalent service. Two services, whose comparative value can only be appreciated, like that of all possible services, by freedom. Now, if it is so, the perfect lawfulness of what is called house-rent, farm-rent, interest, will be explained and justified. Let us consider the case of loan. Suppose two men exchange two services or two objects, whose equal value is beyond all dispute. Suppose, for example, Peter says to Paul, Give me ten sixpences, and I will give you a five-shilling piece. We cannot imagine an equal value more unquestionable. When the bargain is made, neither party has any claim upon the other. The exchanged services are equal. And thus it follows that if one of the parties wishes to introduce into the bargain an additional clause, advantageous to himself, but unfavorable to the other party, he must agree to a second clause, which shall re-establish the equilibrium and the law of justice. It would be absurd to deny the justice of a second clause of compensation. This granted, we will suppose that Peter, after having said to Paul, Give me ten sixpences, I will give you a crown, adds, You shall give me the ten sixpences now, and I will give you the crown piece in a year. It is very evident that this new proposition alters the claims and advantages of the bargain, that it alters the proportion of the two services. Does it not appear plainly enough, in fact, that Peter asks of Paul a new and an additional service, one of a different kind? Is it not as if he had said, Render me the service of allowing me to use for my profit, for a year, five shillings which belong to you, and which you might have used yourself? And what good reason have you to maintain that Paul is bound to render this especial service gratuitously? That he has no right to demand anything more in consequence of this requisition, that the state ought to interfere, to force him to submit? Is it not incomprehensible that the economist, who preaches such a doctrine to the people, can reconcile it with his principle of the reciprocity of services? Here I have introduced cash. I have been led to do so by a desire to place, side by side, two objects of exchange, of a perfect and indisputable equality of value. I was anxious to be prepared for objections. But, on the other hand, my demonstration would have been more striking still, if I had illustrated my principle by an agreement for exchanging the services or the productions themselves. Suppose, for example, a house and a vessel, of a value so perfectly equal, that their proprietors are disposed to exchange them even-handed, 
without excess or abatement. In fact, let the bargain be settled by a lawyer. At the moment of each taking possession, the shipowner says to the citizen, Very well, the transaction is completed, and nothing can prove its perfect equity better than our free and voluntary consent. Our conditions thus fixed, I shall propose to you a little practical modification. You shall let me have your house to-day, but I shall not put you in possession of my ship for a year. And the reason I make this demand of you is, that, during this year of delay, I wish to use the vessel. That we may not be embarrassed by considerations relative to the deterioration of the thing lent, I will suppose the shipowner to add, I will engage at the end of the year to hand over to you the vessel in the state in which it is to-day. I ask of every candid man, I ask of M. Proudon himself, if that citizen has not a right to answer, the new clause which you propose entirely alters the proportion, or the equal value of the exchanged services. By it I shall be deprived, for the space of a year, both at once of my house and of your vessel. By it you will make use of both. If, in the absence of this clause, the bargain was just, for the same reason the clause is injurious to me. It stipulates for a loss to me, and a gain to you. You are requiring of me a new service. I have a right to refuse, or to require of you, as a compensation, an equivalent service. If the parties are agreed upon this compensation, the principle of which is incontestable, we can easily distinguish two transactions in one, two exchanges of service in one. First there is the exchange of the house for the vessel. After this, there is the delay granted by one of the parties, and the compensation correspondent to this delay yielded by the other. These two new services take the generic and abstract names of credit and interest. But names do not change the nature of things, and I defy any one to dare to maintain that there exists here, when all is done, a service for a service, or a reciprocity of services. To say that one of these services does not challenge the other, to say that the first ought to be rendered gratuitously, without injustice, is to say that injustice consists in the reciprocity of services, that justice consists in one of the parties giving and not receiving, which is a contradiction in terms. To give an idea of interest and its mechanism, allow me to make use of two or three anecdotes. But first, I must say a few words upon capital. There are some persons who imagine that capital is money, and this is precisely the reason why they deny its productiveness. For, as M. Fleuré says, crowns are not endowed with the power of reproducing themselves. But it is not true that capital and money are the same thing. Before the discovery of the precious metals, there were capitalists in the world, and I venture to say that at that time, as now, everybody was a capitalist, to a certain extent. What is capital, then? It is composed of three things. First, of the materials upon which men operate, when these materials have already a value communicated by some human effort, which has bestowed upon them the principle of remuneration, wool, flax, leather, silk, wood, etc. Second, instruments which are used for working, tools, machines, ships, carriages, etc. Third, provisions which are consumed during labor, victuals, stuffs, houses, etc. Without these things, the labor of man would be unproductive, and almost void. Yet these very things have required much work, especially at first. This is the reason that so much value has been attached to the possession of them, and also that it is perfectly lawful to exchange and to sell them, to make a profit of them if used, to gain remuneration from them if lent. Now for my anecdotes. End of section 19. Recording by Katie Riley. May 2010.
Section 20 of Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastiat. Translated by Horace White. Section 20. The Sack of Corn. Matherin, in other respects as poor as Job, and obliged to earn his bread by day labor, became, nevertheless, by some inheritance, the owner of a fine piece of uncultivated land. He was exceedingly anxious to cultivate it. Alas, said he, to make ditches, to raise fences, to break the soil, to clear away the brambles and stones, to plough it, to sow it, might bring me a living in a year or two but certainly not to-day or to-morrow. It is impossible to set about farming it without previously saving some provisions for my subsistence until the harvest, and I know by experience that preparatory labor is indispensable in order to render present labor productive. The good Matherin was not content with making these reflections. He resolved to work by the day and to save something from his wages to buy a spade and a sack of corn without which things he must give up his fine agricultural projects. He acted so well, was so active and steady, that he soon saw himself in possession of the wished-for sack of corn. I shall take it to the mill, said he, and then I shall have enough to live upon till my field is covered with a rich harvest. Just as he was starting, Jerome came to borrow his treasure of him. If you will lend me the sack of corn, said Jerome, you will do me a great service, for I have some very lucrative work in view, which I cannot possibly undertake, for want of provisions to live upon until it is finished. I was in the same case, answered Mathurin, and if I have now secured bread for several months, it is at the expense of my arms and my stomach. Upon what principle of justice can it be devoted to the realization of your enterprise, instead of mine? you may well believe that the bargain was a long one. However, it was finished at length, and on these conditions. First, Jerome promised to give back, at the end of the year, a sack of corn of the same quality, and of the same weight, without missing a single grain. This first clause is perfectly just, said he, for without it, Mathurin would give and not lend. Secondly, he engaged to deliver five liters on every hectoliter. This clause is no less just than the other, thought he, for without it, Matherin would do me a service without compensation. He would inflict upon himself a privation. He would renounce his cherished enterprise. He would enable me to accomplish mine. He would cause me to enjoy for a year the fruits of his savings, and all this gratuitously since he delays the cultivation of his land, since he enables me to realize a lucrative labor, it is quite natural that I should let him partake, in a certain proportion, of the profits which I shall gain by the sacrifice he makes of his own. On his side, Mathurin, who was something of a scholar, made this calculation. Since by virtue of the first clause, the sack of corn will return to me at the end of a year, he said to himself, I shall be able to lend it again. It will return to me at the end of the second year. I may lend it again, and so on, to all eternity. However, I cannot deny that it will have been eaten long ago. It is singular that I should be perpetually the owner of a sack of corn, although the one I have lent has been consumed forever. But this is explained thus. It will be consumed in the service of Jerome. It will be put into the power of Jerome to produce a superior value, and consequently Jerome will be able to restore me a sack of corn, or the value of it, without having suffered the slightest injury, but quite the contrary. And as regards myself, this value ought to be my property, as long as I do not consume it myself. If I had used it to clear my land, I should have received it again in the form of a fine harvest. Instead of that, I lend it, 
and shall recover it in the form of repayment. From the second clause I gain another piece of information. At the end of the year I shall be in possession of five liters of corn, over the hundred that I have just lent. If then I were to continue my work by the day, and to save a part of my wages, as I have been doing, in the course of time I should be able to lend two sacks of corn, then three, then four, and when I should have gained a sufficient number to enable me to live on these additions of five liters over and above each, I shall be at liberty to take a little repose in my old age. But how is this? In this case, shall I not be living at the expense of others? No, certainly, for it has been proved that in lending I perform a service. I complete the labor of my borrowers, and only deduct a trifling part of the excess of production, due to my lendings and savings. It is a marvelous thing that a man may thus realize a leisure which injures no one, and for which he cannot be envied without injustice. THE HOUSE Maunder had a house. In building it he had extorted nothing from any one whatever. He owed it to his own personal labor, or, which is the same thing, to labor justly rewarded. His first care was to make a bargain with an architect, in virtue of which, by means of a hundred crowns a year, the latter engaged to keep the house in constant good repair. Mater was already congratulating himself on the happy days which he hoped to spend in this retreat, declared sacred by our Constitution. But Valerius wished to make it his residence. "'How can you think of such a thing?' said Mater. "'It is I who have built it. It has cost me ten years of painful labor, and now you would enjoy it.' They agreed to refer the matter to judges. They chose no profound economists. There were none such in the country. But they found some just and sensible men. It all comes to the same thing. Political economy, justice, good sense are all the same thing. Now here is the decision made by the judges. If Valerius wishes to occupy Maunder's house for a year, he is bound to submit to three conditions. The first is to quit at the end of the year, and to restore the house in good repair, saving the inevitable decay resulting from mere duration. The second, to refund to Maunder the three hundred francs, which the latter pays annually to the architect, to repair the injuries of time. For these injuries, taking place, whilst the house is in the service of Valerius, it is perfectly just that he should bear the consequences. The third, that he should render to Maunder a service equivalent to that which he receives. As to this equivalence of services, it must be freely discussed between Maunder and Valerius. The Plain A very long time ago there lived, in a poor village, a joiner, who was a philosopher, as all my heroes are, in their way. James worked from morning till night, with his two strong arms, but his brain was not idle, for all that. He was fond of reviewing his actions, their causes, and their effects. He sometimes said to himself, With my hatchet, my saw, and my hammer, I can make only coarse furniture, and can only get the pay for such. If I only had a plane, I should please my customers more, and they would pay me more. It is quite just. I can only expect services proportioned to those which I render myself. Yes, I am resolved, I will make myself a plane. However, just as he was setting to work, James reflected further. I work for my customers three hundred days in the year. If I give ten to making my plane, supposing it lasts me a year, only two hundred ninety days will remain for me to make my furniture. Now, in order that I be not the loser in this matter, I must gain henceforth, with the help of the plain, as much in two hundred ninety days as I now do in three hundred. I must even gain more, for unless I do so, it would not be worth my while to venture upon any innovations. James began to calculate. He satisfied himself 
that he should sell his finished furniture at a price which would amply compensate for the ten days devoted to the plane. And when no doubt remained on this point, he set to work. I beg the reader to remark that the power which exists in the tool to increase the productiveness of labor is the basis of the solution which follows. At the end of ten days, James had in his possession an admirable plane, which he valued all the more for having made it himself. He danced for joy, for, like the girl with her basket of eggs, he reckoned all the profits which he expected to derive from the ingenious instrument. But more fortunate than she, he was not reduced to the necessity of saying good-bye to calf, cow, pig, and eggs together. He was building his fine castles in the air, when he was interrupted by his acquaintance William, a joiner in the neighboring village. William, having admired the plain, was struck with the advantages which might be gained from it. He said to James, W. You must do me a service. J. What service? W. Lend me the plain for a year. As might be expected, James at this proposal did not fail to cry out, How can you think of such a thing, William? Well, if I do you this service, what will you do for me in return? W. Nothing. Don't you know that a loan ought to be gratuitous? Don't you know that capital is naturally unproductive? Don't you know fraternity has been proclaimed? If you only do me a service for the sake of receiving one from me in return, what merit would you have? J. William, my friend, fraternity does not mean that all the sacrifices are to be on one side. If so, I do not see why they should not be on yours. Whether a loan should be gratuitous, I don't know. But I do know that if I were to lend you my plane for a year, it would be giving it to you. To tell you the truth, that is not what I made it for. W. Well, we will say nothing about the modern maxims discovered by the socialist gentleman. I ask you to do me a service. What service do you ask of me in return? J. First, then, in a year, the plane will be done for. It will be good for nothing. It is only just that you should let me have another exactly like it, or that you should give me money enough to get it repaired, or that you should supply me the ten days, which I must devote to replacing it. W. This is perfectly just. I submit to these conditions. I engage to return it, or to let you have one like it, or the value of the same. I think you must be satisfied with this, and can require nothing further. J. I think otherwise. I made the plane for myself, and not for you. I expected to gain some advantage from it, by my work being better finished and better paid, by an improvement in my condition. What reason is there that I should make the plane, and you should gain the profit? I might as well ask you to give me your saw and hatchet. What a confusion! Is it not natural that each should keep what he has made with his own hands, as well as his hands themselves? To use without recompense the hands of another, I call slavery. To use without recompense the plane of another, can this be called fraternity? W. But then I have agreed to return it to you at the end of a year, as well polished and as sharp as it is now. J. We have nothing to do with next year. We are speaking of this year. I have made the plane for the sake of improving my work and my condition. If you merely return it to me in a year, it is you who will gain the profit of it during the whole of that time. I am not bound to do you such a service without receiving anything from you in return. Therefore, if you wish for my plane, independently of the entire restoration already bargained for, you must do me a service which we will now discuss. You must grant me remuneration. And this was done. William granted a remuneration calculated in such a way that, at the end of the year, James received his plane quite new, and in addition, a compensation consisting of a new plank, 
for the advantages of which he had deprived himself, and which he had yielded to his friend. It was impossible for any one acquainted with the transaction to discover the slightest trace in it of oppression or injustice. The singular part of it is that at the end of the year the plane came into James' possession, and he lent it again, recovered it, and lent it a third and fourth time. It has passed into the hands of his son, who still lends it. Poor plane! How many times has it changed, sometimes its blade, sometimes its handle? It is no longer the same plane, but it has always the same value, at least for James' posterity. Workmen, let us examine into these little stories. I maintain, first of all, that the sack of corn and the plane are here the type, the model, a faithful representation, the symbol, of all capital. As the five liters of corn and the plank are the type, the model, the representation, the symbol, of all interest. This granted, the following are, it seems to me, a series of consequences, the justice of which it is impossible to dispute. First, if the yielding of a plank by the borrower to the lender is a natural, equitable, lawful remuneration, the just price of a real service, we may conclude that as a general rule it is in the nature of capital to produce interest. When this capital, as in the foregoing examples, takes the form of an instrument of labor, it is clear enough that it ought to bring an advantage to its possessor, to him who has devoted to it his time, his brains, and his strength. Otherwise, why should he have made it? No necessity of life can be immediately satisfied with instruments of labor. No one eats planes or drinks saws, except, indeed, he be a conjurer. If a man determines to spend his time in the production of such things, he must have been led to it by the consideration of the power which these instruments add to his power, of the time which they save him, of the perfection and rapidity which they give to his labor, in a word, to the advantages which they procure for him. Now these advantages, which have been prepared by labor, by the sacrifice of time which might have been used in a more immediate manner, are we bound, as soon as they are ready to be enjoyed, to confer them gratuitously upon another? Would it be an advance in social order, if the law decided thus, and citizens should pay officials for causing such a law to be executed in force? I venture to say that there is not one amongst you who would support it. It would be to legalize, to organize, to systematize injustice itself, for it would be proclaiming that there are men born to render, and others born to receive, gratuitous services. Granted, then, that interest is just, natural, and lawful. Second. A second consequence, not less remarkable than the former, and, if possible, still more conclusive, to which I call your attention, is this. Interest is not injurious to the borrower. I mean to say, the obligation in which the borrower finds himself to pay a remuneration for the use of capital cannot do any harm to his condition. Observe, in fact, that James and William are perfectly free, as regards the transaction to which the plane gave occasion. The transaction cannot be accomplished without the consent of the one as well as of the other. The worst which can happen is, that James may be too exacting. And in this case, William, refusing the loan, remains as he was before. By the fact of his agreeing to borrow, he proves that he considers it an advantage to himself. He proves that after every calculation, including the remuneration, whatever it may be, required of him, he still finds it more profitable to borrow than not to borrow. He only determines to do so because he has compared the inconveniences with the advantages. He has calculated that the day on which he returns the plane, accompanied by the remuneration agreed upon, 
he will have effected more work, with the same labor, thanks to this tool. A profit will remain to him, otherwise he would not have borrowed. The two services of which we are speaking are exchanged according to the law which governs all exchanges, the law of supply and demand. The claims of James have a natural and impassable limit. This is the point in which the remuneration demanded by him would absorb all the advantage which William might find in making use of a plane. In this case, the borrowing would not take place. William would be bound either to make a plane for himself, or to do without one, which would leave him in his original condition. He borrows because he gains by borrowing. I know very well what will be told me. You will say, William may be deceived, or perhaps he may be governed by necessity, and be obliged to submit to a harsh law. It may be so. As to errors in calculation, they belong to the infirmity of our nature, and to argue from this against the transaction in question is objecting the possibility of loss in all imaginable transactions, in every human act. Error is an accidental fact, which is incessantly remedied by experience. In short, everybody must guard against it. As far as those hard necessities are concerned, which force persons to burdensome borrowings, it is clear that these necessities exist previously to the borrowing. If William is in a situation in which he cannot possibly do without a plane, and must borrow one at any price, does this situation result from James having taken the trouble to make the tool? Does it not exist independently of this circumstance? However harsh, however severe James may be, he will never render the supposed condition of William worse than it is. Morally, it is true, the lender will be to blame. But, in an economical point of view, the loan itself can never be considered responsible for previous necessities, which it has not created, and which it relieves to a certain extent. But this proves something to which I shall return. The evident interests of William, representing here the borrowers, there are many Jameses and Plains, in other words, lenders and capitals. It is very evident that if William can say to James, Your demands are exorbitant, there is no lack of planes in the world. He will be in a better situation than if James' plane was the only one to be borrowed. Assuredly, there is no maxim more true than this. Service for service. But let us not forget that no service has a fixed and absolute value compared with others. The contracting parties are free. Each carries his requisitions to the farthest possible point. And the more favorable circumstance for these requisitions is the absence of rivalship. Hence it follows that if there is a class of men more interested than any other in the formation, multiplication, and abundance of capitals, it is mainly that of the borrowers. Now, since capitals can only be formed and increased, by the stimulus and the prospect of remuneration, let this class understand the injury they are inflicting on themselves when they deny the lawfulness of interest, when they proclaim that credit should be gratuitous, when they declaim against the pretended tyranny of capital, when they discourage saving, thus forcing capitals to become scarce, and consequently interests to rise. Third, the anecdote I have just related enables you to explain this apparently singular phenomenon, which is termed the duration or perpetuity of interest. Since, in lending his plane, James has been able, very lawfully, to make it a condition that it should be returned to him at the end of a year, in the same state in which it was when he lent it, is it not evident that he may, at the expiration of the term, lend it again on the same conditions. If he resolves upon the latter plan, the plane will return to him at the end of every year, and that without end. James will then be in a condition 
to lend it without end. That is, he may derive from it a perpetual interest. It will be said that the plane will be worn out. That is true, but it will be worn out by the hand and for the profit of the borrower. The latter has taken into account this gradual wear, and taken upon himself, as he ought, the consequences. He has reckoned that he shall derive from this tool an advantage, which will allow him to restore it in its original condition, after having realized a profit from it. As long as James does not use this capital himself, or for his own advantage, as long as he renounces the advantages which allow it to be restored to its original condition, he will have an incontestable right to have it restored, and that independently of interest. Observe, besides, that if, as I believe I have shown, James, far from doing any harm to William, has done him a service in lending him his plane for a year, for the same reason he will do no harm to a second, a third, a fourth borrower, in the subsequent periods. Hence you may understand that the interest of a capital is as natural, as lawful, as useful, in the thousandth year, as in the first. We may go still further. It may happen that James lends more than a single plane. It is possible that by means of working, of saving, of privations, of order, of activity, he may come to lend a multitude of planes and saws, that is to say, to do a multitude of services. I insist upon this point, that if the first loan has been a social good, it will be the same with all the others. For they are all similar, and based upon the same principle. It may happen, then, that the amount of all the remunerations received by our honest operative, in exchange for services rendered by him, may suffice to maintain him. In this case, there will be a man in the world who has a right to live without working. I do not say that he would be doing right to give himself up to idleness, but I say that he has a right to do so. And if he does so, it will be at nobody's expense, but quite the contrary. If society at all understands the nature of things, it will acknowledge that this man subsists on services which he receives, certainly, as we all do, but which he lawfully receives in exchange for other services, which he himself has rendered, that he continues to render, and which are quite real, inasmuch as they are freely and voluntarily accepted. End of section 20. Recording by Katie Riley. May 2010. Section 21 of Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastia. Translated by Horace White. Section 21. And here we have a glimpse of one of the finest harmonies in the social world. I allude to leisure. Not that leisure that the warlike and tyrannical classes arrange for themselves by the plunder of the workers, but that leisure which is the lawful and innocent fruit of past activity and economy. In expressing myself thus, I know that I shall shock many received ideas. But see... Is not leisure an essential spring in the social machine? Without it, the world would never have had a Newton, a Pascal, a Fenelon. Mankind would have been ignorant of all arts, sciences, and of those wonderful inventions, prepared originally by investigations of mere curiosity. Thought would have been inert. Man would have made no progress. On the other hand, if leisure could only be explained by plunder and oppression, if it were a benefit which could only be enjoyed unjustly and at the expense of others, there would be no middle path between these two evils. 
either mankind would be reduced to the necessity of stagnating in a vegetable and stationary life, in eternal ignorance, from the absence of wheels to its machine, or else it would have to acquire these wheels at the price of inevitable injustice, and would necessarily present the sad spectacle, in one form or another, of the antique classification of human beings into masters and slaves. I defy any one to show me, in this case, any other alternative. We should be compelled to contemplate the divine plan which governs society, with the regret of thinking that it presents a deplorable chasm. The stimulus of progress would be forgotten, or, which is worse, this stimulus would be no other than injustice itself. But, no, God has not left such a chasm in his work of love. We must take care not to disregard his wisdom and power. For those whose imperfect meditations cannot explain the lawfulness of leisure, are very much like the astronomer who said, at a certain point in the heavens, there ought to exist a planet which will be at last discovered, for without it the celestial world is not harmony, but discord. Well, I say, that if well understood, the history of my humble plain, although very modest, is sufficient to raise us to the contemplation of one of the most consoling, but least understood, of the social harmonies. It is not true that we must choose between the denial or the unlawfulness of leisure. Thanks to rent and its natural duration, leisure may arise from labor and saving. It is a pleasing prospect, which every one may have in view, a noble recompense, to which each may aspire. It makes its appearance in the world. It distributes itself proportionably to the exercise of certain virtues. It opens all the avenues to intelligence. It ennobles, it raises the morals, it spiritualizes the soul of humanity, not only without laying any weight on those of our brethren whose lot in life devotes them to severe labor, but relieving them gradually from the heaviest and most repugnant part of this labor. It is enough that capitals should be formed, accumulated, multiplied, should be lent on conditions less and less burdensome, that they should descend, penetrate into every social circle, and that, by an admirable progression, after having liberated the lenders, they should hasten the liberation of the borrowers themselves. For that end, the laws and customs ought to be favorable to economy, the source of capital. It is enough to say that the first of all these conditions is, not to alarm, to attack, to deny that which is the stimulus of saving, and the reason of its existence, interest. As long as we see nothing passing from hand to hand, in the character of loan, but provisions, materials, instruments, things indispensable to the productiveness of labor itself, the idea thus far exhibited will not find many opponents. Who knows, even, that I may not be reproached for having made great effort to burst what may be said to be an open door. But as soon as cash makes its appearance as the subject of the transaction, and it is this which appears almost always, immediately a crowd of objections are raised. Money, it will be said, will not reproduce itself, like your sack of corn. It does not assist labor, like your plane. It does not afford an immediate satisfaction, like your house. It is incapable, by its nature, of producing interest, of multiplying itself, and the remuneration it demands is a positive extortion. Who cannot see the sophistry of this? Who does not see that cash is only a transient form, which men give at the time to other values, to real objects of usefulness, for the sole object of facilitating their arrangements? In the midst of social complications, the man who is in a condition to lend scarcely ever has the exact thing which the borrower wants. James, it is true, has a plane, but perhaps William wants a saw, they cannot negotiate. The transaction favorable to both cannot take place. 
and then what happens? It happens that James first exchanges his plane for money. He lends the money to William, and William exchanges the money for a saw. The transaction is no longer a simple one. It is decomposed into two parts, as I explained above in speaking of exchange. But, for all that, it has not changed its nature. It still contains all the elements of a direct loan. James has still got rid of a tool which was useful to him. William has still received an instrument which perfects his work and increases his profits. There is still a service rendered by the lender, which entitles him to receive an equivalent service from the borrower. This just balance is not the less established by free mutual bargaining. The very natural obligation to restore at the end of the term the entire value still constitutes the principle of the duration of interest. At the end of a year, says M. Thore, will you find an additional crown in a bag of a hundred pounds? No, certainly, if the borrower puts the bag of one hundred pounds on the shelf. In such a case, neither the plane nor the sack of corn would reproduce themselves. But it is not for the sake of leaving the money in the bag, nor the plane on the hook, that they are borrowed. The plane is borrowed to be used, or the money to procure a plane. And if it is clearly proved that this tool enables the borrower to obtain profits which he would not have made without it, if it is proved that the lender has renounced creating for himself this excess of profits, we may understand how the stipulation of a part of this excess of profits in favor of the lender is equitable and lawful. Ignorance of the true part which cash plays in human transactions is the source of the most fatal errors. I intend devoting an entire pamphlet to this subject. From what we may infer from the writings of M. Proudhon, that which has led him to think that gratuitous credit was a logical and definite consequence of social progress, is the observation of the phenomenon which shows a decreasing interest, almost in direct proportion, to the rate of civilization. In barbarous times it is, in fact, cent, per cent, and more. Then it descends to eighty, sixty, fifty, forty, twenty, ten, eight, five, four, and three per cent. In Holland it has even been as low as two per cent. Hence it is concluded that, in proportion as society comes to perfection, it will descend to zero, by the time civilization is complete. In other words, that which characterizes social perfection is the gratuitousness of credit. When, therefore, we shall have abolished interest, we shall have reached the last step of progress. This is mere sophistry, and as such false arguing may contribute to render popular the unjust, dangerous, and destructive dogma, that credit should be gratuitous, by representing it as coincident with social perfection, with the reader's permission I will examine in a few words this new view of the question. What is interest? It is the service rendered, after a free bargain, by the borrower to the lender, in remuneration for the service he has received by the loan. By what law is the rate of these remunerative services established? By the general law which regulates the equivalent of all services, that is, by the law of supply and demand. The more easily a thing is procured, the smaller is the service rendered by yielding it or lending it. The man who gives me a glass of water in the Pyrenees does not render me so great a service as he who allows me one in the desert of Sahara. If there are many plains, sacks of corn, or houses in a country, the use of them is obtained, other things being equal, on more favorable conditions than if they were few. For the simple reason that the lender renders in this case a smaller relative service. It is not surprising, therefore, that the more abundant capitals are, the lower is the interest. 
Is this saying that it will ever reach zero? No, because, I repeat it, the principle of remuneration is in the loan. To say that interest will be annihilated is to say that there will never be any motive for saving, for denying ourselves, in order to form new capitals, nor even to preserve the old ones. In this case, the waste would immediately bring a void, and interest would directly reappear. In that, the nature of the services of which we are speaking does not differ from any other. Thanks to industrial progress, a pair of stockings which used to be worth six francs has successively been worth only four, three, and two. No one can say to what point this value will descend, but we can affirm that it will never reach zero, unless the stockings finish by producing themselves spontaneously. Why? Because the principle of remuneration is in the labor, because he who works for another renders a service, and ought to receive a service. If no one paid for stockings, they would cease to be made, and with the scarcity, the price would not fail to reappear. This sophism which I am now combating has its roots in the infinite divisibility which belongs to value, as it does to matter. It appears at first paradoxical, but it is well known to all mathematicians that, through all eternity, fractions may be taken from a weight without the weight ever being annihilated. It is sufficient that each successive fraction be less than the preceding one, in a determined and regular proportion. There are countries where people apply themselves to increasing the size of horses, or diminishing in sheep the size of the head. It is impossible to say precisely to what point they will arrive in this. No one can say that he has seen the largest horse, or the smallest sheep's head, that will ever appear in the world. But he may safely say that the size of horses will never attain to infinity, nor the heads of sheep to nothing. In the same way, no one can say to what point the price of stockings, nor the interest of capitals, will come down. But we may safely affirm, when we know the nature of things, that neither the one nor the other will ever arrive at zero. For labor and capital can no more live without recompense than a sheep without a head. The arguments of M. Proudhon reduce themselves, then, to this. Since the most skillful agriculturalists are those who have reduced the heads of sheep to the smallest size, we shall have arrived at the highest agricultural perfection when sheep no longer have any heads. Therefore, in order to realize the perfection, let us behead them. I have now done with this wearisome discussion. Why is it that the breath of false doctrine has made it needful to examine into the intimate nature of interest? I must not leave all without remarking upon a beautiful moral which may be drawn from this law. The depression of interest is proportioned to the abundance of capitals. This law being granted, if there is a class of men to whom it is more important than to any other that capitals be formed, accumulate, multiply, abound and superabound, it is certainly the class which borrows them directly or indirectly. It is those men who operate upon materials, who gain assistance by instruments, who live upon provisions, produced and economized by other men. Imagine, in a vast and fertile country, a population of a thousand inhabitants, destitute of all capital thus defined. It will assuredly perish by the pangs of hunger. Let us suppose a case hardly less cruel. Let us suppose that ten of these savages are provided with instruments and provisions sufficient to work and to live themselves until harvest time, as well as to remunerate the services of eighty laborers. The inevitable result will be the death of nine hundred human beings. It is clear, then, that since nine hundred and ninety men 
urged by want, will crowd upon the supports which would only maintain a hundred, the ten capitalists will be masters of the market. They will obtain labor on the hardest conditions, for they will put it up to auction, or the highest bidder. And observe this. If these capitalists entertain such pious sentiments as would induce them to impose personal privations on themselves, in order to diminish the sufferings of some of their brethren, this generosity, which attaches to morality, will be as noble in its principle as useful in its effects. But if, duped by that false philosophy which persons wish so inconsiderately to mingle with economic laws, they take to remunerating labor largely, far from doing good, they will do harm. They will give double wages, it may be, but then forty-five men will be better provided for, whilst forty-five others will come to augment the number of those who are sinking into the grave. Upon this supposition, it is not the lowering of wages which is the mischief, it is the scarcity of capital. Low wages are not the cause, but the effect of the evil. I may add that they are to a certain extent the remedy. It acts in this way. It distributes the burden of suffering as much as it can, and saves as many lives as a limited quantity of sustenance permits. Suppose now that instead of ten capitalists, there should be a hundred, two hundred, five hundred. Is it not evident that the condition of the whole population, and above all, that of the proletaires, will be more and more improved? Is it not evident that, apart from every consideration of generosity, they would obtain more work and better pay for it? That they themselves will be in a better condition to form capitals, without being able to fix the limits to this ever-increasing facility of realizing equality and well-being? Would it not be madness in them to admit such doctrines, and to act in a way which would drain the source of wages, and paralyze the activity and stimulus of saving? Let them learn this lesson, then. Doubtless, capitals are good for those who possess them, who denies it. But they are also useful to those who have not yet been able to form them, and it is important to those who have them not, that others should have them. Yes, if the proletaires knew their true interests, they would seek, with the greatest care, what circumstances are, and what are not, favorable to saving, in order to favor the former and to discourage the latter. They would sympathize with every measure which tends to the rapid formation of capitals. They would be enthusiastic promoters of peace, liberty, order, security, the union of classes and peoples, economy, moderation in public expenses, simplicity in the machinery of government. For it is under this way of all these circumstances that saving does its work, brings plenty within the reach of the masses, invites those persons to become the formers of capital who were formerly under the necessity of borrowing upon hard conditions. They would repel with energy the warlike spirit which diverts from its true course so large a part of human labor, the monopolizing spirit which deranges the equitable distribution of riches, in the way by which liberty alone can realize it. The multitude of public services, which attack our purses only to check our liberty, and, in short, those subversive, hateful, thoughtless doctrines, which alarm capital, prevent its formation, oblige it to flee, and finally to raise its price, to the special disadvantage of the workers, who bring it into operation. Well, and in this respect, is not the revolution of February a hard lesson? Is it not evident that the insecurity it has thrown into the world of business, on the one hand, and on the other, the advancement of the fatal theories to which I have alluded, and which, from the clubs, have almost penetrated into the regions of the legislature, have everywhere raised the rate of interest? Is it not evident 
that from the time the proletaires have found greater difficulty in procuring those materials, instruments, and provisions without which labor is impossible? Is it not that which has caused stoppages, and do not stoppages in their turn lower wages? Thus there is a deficiency of labor to the proletaires, from the same cause which loads the objects they consume with an increase of price, in consequence of the rise of interest. High interest, low wages, means in other words that the same article preserves its price, but that the part of the capitalist has invaded, without profiting himself, that of the workmen. A friend of mine, commissioned to make inquiry into Parisian industry, has assured me that the manufacturers have revealed to him a very striking fact, which proves, better than any reasoning can, how much insecurity and uncertainty injure the formation of capital. It was remarked that during the most distressing period, the popular expenses of mere fancy had not diminished. The small theatres, the fighting lists, the public houses, the tobacco depots, were as much frequented as in prosperous times. In the inquiry, the operatives themselves explained this phenomenon thus. What is the use of pinching? Who knows what will happen to us? Who knows that interest will not be abolished? Who knows but that the state will become a universal and gratuitous lender, and that it will wish to annihilate all the fruits which we might expect from our savings? Well, I say that if such ideas could prevail during two single years, it would be enough to turn our beautiful France into a turkey, misery would become general and endemic, and most assuredly the poor would be the first upon whom it would fall. Workmen, they talk to you a great deal upon the artificial organization of labor. Do you know why they do so? because they are ignorant of the laws of its natural organization, that is, of the wonderful organization which results from liberty. You are told that liberty gives rise to what is called the radical antagonism of classes, that it creates and makes to clash two opposite interests, that of the capitalists and that of the proletaires. But we ought to begin by proving that this antagonism exists by a law of nature, and afterwards it would remain to be shown how far the arrangements of restraint are superior to those of liberty, for between liberty and restraint I see no middle path. Again, it would remain to be proved that restraint would always operate to your advantage and to the prejudice of the rich. But no, this radical antagonism, this natural opposition of interests, does not exist. It is only an evil dream of perverted and intoxicated imaginations. No, a plan so defective has not proceeded from the divine mind. To affirm it, we must begin by denying the existence of God, and see how, by means of social laws, and because men exchange amongst themselves their labors, and their productions, see what a harmonious tie attaches the classes, one to the other. There are the landowners. What is their interest? That the soil be fertile, and the sun beneficent. And what is the result? That corn abounds, that it falls in price, and the advantage turns to the profit of those who have had no patrimony. There are the manufacturers. What is their constant thought? To perfect their labor, to increase the power of their machines, to procure for themselves, upon the best terms, the raw material. And to what does all this tend? To the abundance and low price of produce. That is, that all the efforts of the manufacturers, and without their suspecting it, result in a profit to the public consumer, of which each of you is one. It is the same with every profession. Well, the capitalists are not exempt from this law. They are very busy making schemes, economizing, and turning them to their advantage. 
This is all very well. But the more they succeed, the more do they promote the abundance of capital, and, as a necessary consequence, the reduction of interest. Now, who is it that profits by the reduction of interest? Is it not the borrower first, and finally, the consumers of the things which the capitals contribute to produce? It is therefore certain that the final result of the efforts of each class is the common good of all. You are told that capital tyrannizes over labor. I do not deny that each one endeavors to draw the greatest possible advantage from his situation, but, in this case, he realizes only that which is possible. Now, it is never more possible for capitals to tyrannize over labor than when they are scarce, for then it is they who make the law, it is they who regulate the rate of sale. Never is this tyranny more impossible to them than when they are abundant, for, in that case, it is labor which has the command. Away, then, with the jealousies of classes, ill-will, unfounded hatreds, unjust suspicions. These depraved passions injure those who nourish them in their hearts. This is no declamatory morality. It is a chain of causes and effects, which is capable of being rigorously, mathematically demonstrated. It is not the less sublime in that it satisfies the intellect as well as the feelings. I shall sum up this whole dissertation with these words. Workmen, laborers, proletaires, destitute and suffering classes. Will you improve your condition? You will not succeed by strife, insurrection, hatred, and error. But there are three things which cannot perfect the entire community without extending these benefits to yourselves. These things are peace, liberty, and security. End of section 21. Recording by Katie Riley. May 2010. End of Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastia. Translated by Horace White.